Hello! What the hell's going on, everybody? Does anybody know what this sentence means? Gray, have you seen the message from YouTube that messages are going away from 18 September? What does that mean? Okay, uh, what, what does that even mean? It, it's just... I need stuff to make more sense, you know what I mean? When you type something in. I have no idea what that means. Alright, uh, <clears throat> let's see. There was something that's kind of funny uh, tonight. I was writing my... Uh, I was riding my exercise bike in a, in a back room and... Um, my wife's outside doing work, but apparently I accidentally locked the side door when she's out there. You know, you just get used to locking a door. And I'm on my bike and I hear this sound on the window, like <laughs> It was like water and stuff hitting the window and then a rock, and then a rock. Then I opened the window and I saw her and she's like, and I go, hey, leave me alone. I'm riding my bike. You know, I didn't re <laughs> Anyway, so I, you know, I shut the thing and I'm on my bike and I'm pedaling and pedaling and I'm wondering, God, what, that's crazy. She was like trying to tease me. And then she starts pounding on the side door and then said, you locked me? Yeah, I don't know. You had to be here, I guess, but it was pretty funny. We both got a big laugh out of it after the initial anger at me. Why didn't you have your phone? Well, what do you mean? Why do I don't, why would I have my phone while I'm riding a bike and you're just right there in the backyard, you know? Yeah. So that's it. <laughs> but I, I didn't mean to accidentally uh, lock her out there. What, what was funny, though, to me was just how unoblivious I was to anything that she was trying to say. Right? Like, I had no idea what... Um, I thought she was just watering and maybe trying to get some spider web or something up off the roof or something I, I just you know was riding my bike and then it got louder and I'm like god leave me alone I'm just you know <laughs> anyways it was weird uh, so anyways um, let's see so you guys all know about the EVP readings right I mean that's some good shit right wow that stuff really works and I'm, I'm really starting to believe it more now because uh, Cairo, he was out, out on the road and he actually had an instance of a true EVP reading that worked. Look at this. It's crazy. Watch this. It's time to solve some crimes. <laughs> Fifteen? Fifteen what? Fifteen steps? Fifteen steps. Fifteen steps. You hear that? He got fifteen steps from the... <laughs> oh, look at that. Ooh. An apple. Whoa. Look up. Oh, a carrot. Oh, man, I love my spirit box. What? Wait. Logan's horse. Logan's horse framed Chris Watts. I got to make a podcast. <laughs> Come on. That was pretty good. That's incredible, man. And I'm wondering how he found the carrot that actually had that that writing on it. It's amazing. I mean, that's a freaking miracle. I mean, how in the hell he found that carrot with the writing on it, we'll never know. And, and then the apple that pointed to the carrot. And it only came about because when he was listening to the spirit box, it said 15 feet, uh, steps. So he took 15 steps, and by God, if it didn't lead to an apple, and then he looked at it, he looked at it and went, wow, and it said, look up. So he looked up, and by God, there was a carrot 
And apparently there's an association with Logan's horse and Chris Watts. It's amazing. All right. So you can see that kind of stuff if you go visit the Spirit Box channels out there that are selling you absolute garbage, um, yet people actually believe it. All right. Well, that's not fair, Gray. You didn't do it the way they do it. See, they actually communicate and build a rapport with an alien. You know. Hey, look at it. Uh, it's bullshit. All right. Spirit box videos. If you spend more than thirty seconds on that, you're deranged. Okay, you have something wrong with your brain if you spend more than ten seconds on one of those channels. All right. There's absolutely zero to it. Uh, especially when it's an app that you download off of Google Store. You know, it's not like uh, you went to some shaman somewhere and found this device that conjures up these sounds. No, you downloaded an app on Google Play, all right? <laughs> Doesn't that tell you something? Right. Okay, there you go. All right. So, anyways, we got some. Uh, we're gonna go over some old cold cases tonight again. And what was weird is I, I found the cold cases in. Um, they're in Indiana. And let me show you what was going on. Well, before I do that, though, there was a, a press conference today on the case that we discussed last night. The um, Heidi Lynn Childs and David Lee Met, uh, Metzler. You remember the one where they were both shot right here in this. Um, they're both religious people and they were shot. That's if you were paying attention to the show. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, they were right here. And they gave a little bit more information today at the press conference. And that's usually what press conferences do. But uh, here we go. I'll just skip it around. And retired Sergeant Miss Colonel Lyon is a law enforcement leader. Okay, here we go. Sure, and uh, thank you for hosting us today. Can you guys hear that at all? Uh, oh, wait, I can turn it up. Thank you very much. There we go. Uh, as a law enforcement leader, this is not easy for me, or is it easy for anyone in the public safety profession in attendance today? It's not easy for us to stand here 10 years later and not be able to say to you that we have the individual or individuals responsible for David and Heidi's deaths in our custody. But that doesn't mean that our task force hasn't and isn't continuing to make progress on this case. In fact, for every day that goes by, it just adds to the determination of the investigators assigned to this case to bring the killer or the killers to justice. We have specific individuals we are interested in and pursuing related to this case. We have an extensive inventory of evidence collected from the scene and from vehicles seized during the course of the investigation. We have DNA and we're working to take See, they have DNA. of 10 years worth of technological and scientific <laughs> they should have been on this last year and testing yeah. as well as <clears throat> criminal databases we have new leads coming in that we're pursuing but we still need the public's help to put the parts and the pieces together to bring justice to Heidi David and their families we know there are people <clears throat> right here in Montgomery County across the New River Valley who know exactly what happened 10 years ago, the evening of August 26, 2009, in the parking lot at Caldwell Fields at the edge of the Jefferson National Forest. We want and we need to hear from you. There are others who don't know what happened, but suspect they know someone who does know. These are folks <laughs> who've noticed maybe a friend, a family uh, member. Hey, Chris, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. Cool, all right. suddenly changed 
following the night of There's August a lot of people found out there. Be more specific. Send me an email, all right? Was Thanks. that someone suddenly obsessed with, or did they get easily agitated by any mention of the Caldwell Field murders or the young Virginia type couple? Even information as simple as that could prove invaluable to, to where we are right now in this ongoing and active investigation. Again, we encourage you to reach out to us and share with us what you know or what you may have noticed, or what you may still suspect is occurring. It was shortly after 8 p.m. that Wednesday evening when David and Heidi arrived in Caldwell Fields. So here's the explanation. Lot in David's navy blue 1992 Toyota Camper. The sun had just set. It was a typical warm August evening in the mountains of Montgomery County. Now David had been to Caldwell Fields once before, attending a men's Christian retreat, and he wanted Heidi to see for herself the beauty and the tranquil setting of that area at the National Forest. David brought his guitar to play for them. But they weren't even planning on staying very long or staying out late that night. However, they, ne they never made it out of the car before they were brutally attacked. Heidi and David's bodies were discovered early the next morning on August 27th by a gentleman walking his dogs there at Caldwell Fields. Two incredible young lives were stolen, and countless other lives tragically have been impacted forever by this tragic incident. David's guitar was still there inside the Camry. Heidi's purse was taken and it's still missing, along with her credit cards, her Virginia Tech ID card, her lanyard, her cell phone, and her camera. So that's something that somebody mentioned last night, but we didn't know. So um, her purse was taken and had basically every single thing of hers in it, her camera, or, you know, I don't know if it was in the purse, but her purse was taken, her phone, her lanyard that I guess held her cell phone, um, her ID card, every single thing that she probably brought with her was gone. They don't, they don't have that. Now, someone out there knows so we can what play happened that again. there inside the Camry. Heidi's purse was taken. Purse? She's still missing, along with her credit cards. Credit cards. Her Virginia Tech ID card. Virginia Tech ID. Her lanyard, her cell phone. Her lanyard, her cell and phone. Her camera. And her camera. Now someone out there knows what happened to those items. Somebody knows that. Someone out there knows something, or knows someone who does know. I don't something. know why why you guys are talking about 1992. This happened in uh, 2009. Too long. It's been 10 years. It's time for somebody to come forward, get it off your chest. Get it off your conscience. Let these families find some peace, some sense of peace as they move forward in their lives. Heidi's parents and <laughs> siblings, David's parents and siblings, all their friends, they've all been held hostage long enough. So okay, I'm going to keep moving it. A second. <laughs> so, like family members speak. I thought that the father. We're all very uh, interested in each other and develop. She was. Just it just gets, it's just kind of emotional. This guy here says some good stuff. A career. I don't want to play the whole thing. He was very close to them to actually hunting together. He loved the outdoors and yet also a good football game on TV. He, he, he speaks directly to the killer and stuff like that. Sisters. Almost seems scripted a little bit. I mean, he did write it down, obviously. He was a good-natured kid who was kind and friendly to everyone. He especially favored the underdog. He respected Heidi and her parents and had a pure and godly relationship with her. Yeah, as we hear in there, I don't know if it slipped out, but um, I think this guy might say it. But it, um, they were shot with a, a 30 30 rifle, but at close range, point-blank range, both of them. And... Uh, you know, he was found in the vehicle and she was outside the vehicle. He cared for her deeply. And I miss him deeply. I miss them deeply. My wife expressed the extent of our loss very well. 
We feel the loss every day, even in the supposedly happy times like Christmas and birthdays. They are all tainted with the bitter taste of loss, missing David, all he was and all he would become. Hey, Audra, good to see you. The fun things that I used to look forward to, like vacations and golfing and hunting, instead of joy, they are reminders of David and Heidi's absence. And not just their absence, but their murders. That's an awful word, murder. Unfortunately, it is all too familiar in our family now. Can you imagine it applied to yours? Still, sometimes it's hard to believe. I, but it's I, also I already hard discussed to that. that there's a person who is so evil and wicked that he could just brutally innocent murder. Brutal. Are those the two guys up in Canada that you're talking about, Chris? Yeah, I mean, if you have something like that, just send me an email instead of. Uh, I'm not going to say it again. It seems like every show I have to say the same thing. Innocent, defenseless kids with a high power rifle at point blank range. See, that's right. He gave that part away. I wonder if they're you like, know oh, the kind shit. Of person you know? Who is so evil and wicked that he could just brutally innocent murder, brute innocent. See, it sounds a lot like Carter. Kids. You know what I mean? With a little bit like Carter. Rifle. So I'm going to back it up a little bit. There we go. Still, sometimes it's hard to believe. But it's also hard to believe that there's a person who is so evil and wicked that he could just brutally innocent murder, brute innocent, defenseless kids with a high power rifle at point blank range. You know the kind of person, the one depicted on shows like criminal minds yeah. and others. What does that got to do with anything, Lisa? They stand over helpless, innocent people who are pleading for their lives. But they just burn or torture or shoot and kill them. That didn't make any sense to what I said. Only 10 years ago at Caldwell Fields, it wasn't a make-believe. It wasn't a TV show. And the bullets pierced our children over and over. Well, I guess they were shot multiple times from close ra uh, range or just in their eyes were ignored. That's suffered. not what happened there, Lisa. It's not what happened. Hopes, dreams, and life gone. No hugs, no goodbyes. Yeah, we got Parents a live one here. We got another troll showing shot, up. Shocked, scared, and distraught. The family's devastated. And the perpetrator goes his merry way. Yeah. First of all, uh, what Chris did is he showed up and he said, um, hey, can you cover the case with those two guys that died? I mean, there are thousands and thousands of people. I didn't even know what the hell he was talking about. So I said, what case are you talking about? And then he said, oh, the case with uh, uh, Ryan Provencher and Richard Skirt. Well, I'm doing a show right now, not on that topic, okay? I'm not doing a show. I'm doing a show on different topics. So it's really rude to type in and try to ask me a question about doing a show on something else when I'm talking about something else, okay? I've, I've said this a thousand times on my shows. And I apologize, but it actually is starting to get a little bit frustrating for me. Okay? I told him to send me an email with it. Or her. I don't know if that's a her or him, the name. Okay, see, that's what I'm saying. Get out of here, Lisa. Man, you're just another one of those people, the high and mighty, holier-than-thou idiots that show up to the shows. Hold on. Let me get you out of here. See you later. Yeah. All right? So what I'm trying to tell you is that I told him to... Just send me an email. I look at, I, I mean, ask people who send me emails. I respond to most of them, and I look at them, and I check out what they're doing. I've asked people to do that, okay? But to literally, um, you know, when the press conference is going on, I'm looking at the comments to try to be a little bit more engaging. And then people are saying, Gray, 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 can you do this one? Can you do this one? And it's like, can we just do the show that I'm doing tonight? Send me an email, and, and I might cover the case that you want to talk about. Uh, another time, but I actually did cover that, uh, I think, two nights ago. Right? I, I talked about it. Okay? And yes, maybe people don't watch it. So I said, yes, I covered that the, a couple nights ago. All right? And so, I don't know. <laughs> Pretty soon I'm just going to go back to making videos, you know, because it gets really, you know, you get the holier-than-thou types that show up. You get the everybody just, it just sucks, you know. 
and just throws the whole sh yeah, everything off because all I wanted to do was say no um, yeah send me an email I'll cover it that's what I said I ah, forget it fuck it Jeez. it's hard to believe that this type of person a cold-hearted merciless murderer is walking around right now maybe not too far from here what is, what is almost harder to believe is that there are other people, basically decent people, without intentionally evil and wicked hearts, who have decided to partner with well, this perpetrator. Well, if they decided to partner, then they, they would, would be, be wicked. They would be disgusted and grieved by the fictitious TV portrayal of that brutal one who tortures and kills the innocent, but they have decided to support the real one, maybe out of fear. They know who did this or they know someone who does. They have vital information to solve this case and they have kept silent. They had a decision to make early on. Decide with the cold-blooded killer who devastated innocent families. So doesn't it sound like Carter in the Delphi kids. case a little bit? Like really sort of... Stand up for what's right. I, I guarantee that this was formulated by the FBI a little bit. They have chosen by their silence cast their vote for the murderer. Now that's what's hard to believe. It breaks my heart. But, it, but it's not too late. These folks can undo that decision by breaking their silence and making it right. They can follow a true course for their heart with a simple phone call. Yeah, it's got the you religious overtones inside in real life with the one you would naturally side with on a TV show. Will you do this before this person devastates another family? Yeah, here's the thing. Uh, I've decided. You guys, whatever the hell you guys want to talk about, go ahead and talk about it. My problem is, is when I jump into the chat and I see comments that aren't related, I, I'm, I try to go back up and read to see where how it got to that, and then I get sort of sidetracked. So what, what I'm going to do is just not care i'm going to try to not give a damn if you guys are talking about something else okay mm -hmm. that's what my uh, goal is going to try to be all right so I, I want you guys to be able to talk about whatever the hell you want to talk about it's just <laughs> that's i guess that's my fault that it bothers me uh well thanks sandra i mean i'll i'll you know i might make more videos though too because that way I can just control what's going on. Gray, it's not easy being you. Please, no videos. I prefer you live. <laughs> you don't want me to go back to using the, the voices of uh, animated... Hey, uh, what, was the, what was the voice? Uh, 43 feet to the bind. <laughs> oh, never mind. Would you do that before he tortures and kills another innocent victim? Thanks, Sandra. Please do it because it's the right thing to do. Do it to clear your guilty conscience. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dig Worms. Right now, I am that innocent pleading victim asking you for mercy. Will you be the cold-hearted <laughs> one that ignores yeah, the ass, yeah. and protects the one who tortures and kills? Yeah. So they're saying, why would you protect the one who tortures and kills? Make that call for no justice. Please just call the task force and call. They have incredible ways to protect you. After 10 years, it's time. I think this guy's FBI back here. To he looks like right here. I can imagine the traumatic, violent, and gruesome images you created that night haunt you. Oh, thanks, super days. mean Sadie. <laughs> the guilt and shame are probably heavy on I don't know if it works or not. I think people who are that I evil don't, the they don't even believe in any of this stuff. So they don't he care. You know. and he, like mine, was brutally murdered. Unlike mine, he was the perfect, sinless son of God. And he proved that by rising from the dead and conquering death and sin. And his death and suffering paid the price and was the sacrifice for my many sins and yours. 
God graciously and kindly punished his own son to purchase my pardon and yours from the eternal punishment we both deserve. An eternal punishment infinitely worse than any sentence you might receive here on earth. We would love for you to know his forgiveness and ours. Well, because they're religious people, Mary. They, no sin, sin they, think it, they hope it has an effect. I pray that God's kindness would lead you to repentance and confession and a genuine trust in Jesus. Yeah, so there might be a chance that somebody who did this 10 years ago, maybe they got married later, had kids, and then they realized how horrible it was what they did, and they felt guilty over the years. And maybe this will be just that little bit of a nudge to get them, you know, who knows? It, it probably won't work, but why not give it a shot, right? as it did me. Finally, I want to sincerely thank the members of the task force, present and past, for their <laughs> perseverance, dedication, hard work, and professionalism, as well as their personal kindness to us as they worked this case. And thank you to the many media professionals that are helping to get our story and our plea out. Over the years, many agencies, including the ones represented here today, have worked together to conduct interviews and process evidence in the hopes of bringing to justice the person or persons responsible for Heidi and David's murders. It may have been 10 years since this nightmare began for their families, but the investigation is far from over. <clears throat> Part of the FBI's mission is to assist our local yeah, FBI law can. enforcement partners doesn't he just look like a, a cliche so FBI guy? announce that in addition <laughs> to investigative resources that have been and will continue to be devoted to this investigation, the FBI is contributing $28,000 for information that leads to the identification and arrest of the person or persons responsible for these murders. With the addition of this $28,000, the total reward amount is now $100,000. As parents, community members, in law enforcement, we ask that anyone who has information about this investigation to please contact the Virginia State Police at 540-375-9589 or vspunsolved.com. Okay. We are here today. That's the same thing, different angle. Is in their grief and our person or contributing to questions. Well, there's questions that wasn't on the other video. The cameraman's all over the place trying to get some focus. How many tips have you gotten and how many might have been recently? What have you seen recently? I don't know that I can specifically tell you the number of tips. <laughs> I had a hard time with that word. I know there's, there's many of them. Uh, and I don't know what we've had recently, but they continue to come in. Uh, where's Lieutenant White at? He might be able to share some of that. Uh, he's been very involved in this, certainly the continuity part of it over the last several years so he might be able to provide that if he can yeah we've uh we're still we're getting tips in on a daily basis right now uh sometimes multiple tips a day and at this point we have um well over well over a thousand leads that have been worked and followed up on um and you know as, as the new leads come in the task force will continue to work on those leads and follow up on new tips <laughs> that guy's probably like 6'9". That's huge. Yeah. Maybe even 6'10 or something. Yeah. Are you going to Well, the task force, of course, it's a collaboration of all the agencies that you see represented here today. And initially, they were meeting, meeting early and often. Uh, but now it's kind of sporadic and it based on the information that's being received, but they're still in, in contact and moving forward, this task force will continue to work at a very, very uh, eager effort to try to solve this case. Uh, Kenny might be able to tell us how long they've been meeting or in terms of how uh, There was just two weeks ago that you uh, also had one about the uh, case in New Kent. Is this something that uh, the state police now is devoting a little more time to Staff, or is it just something that oh yeah, somebody related it to um, one of the serial killers. Well, it's part like, of it's changing in terms of technology. I don't know. 
you know, 10 years is a long time, and uh, you've certainly seen it across the country that, that these, these cases that are 5, 10 years, 15 years old 20, 30, are constantly 40. being worked. And sometimes we come back and we kind of hit the reset button to go back and review what we've done, how we've done it. I really don't want to get into that at this point. You said DNA um, that you all recovered. Can you kind of give some examples of what kind of DNA? That you no. Recovered? We have DNA. Uh, we have it. And we want to try to take advantage of any new technology that's out there. So I really don't want to get into that. How come you're just now thinking of that? Uh, that should have been a year ago. All of you have mentioned there are individuals who live or may still know something. Do you, how confident are you that those people are still in this area close to where the crime took place? Well, I, I'm going to say that we're confident, aren't we? We're confident. Colonel, maybe this should go to the sheriff, but you know, a lot of publicity, even for today, has been in the media. That's right. That's what I think, too, Kyra. A lot of parents walked down to the hotel and saw TV and uh, newspapers with this on the headlines. Is there anything you'd like to say to the parents and new students that are moving in this week? Nah, I forget. Yeah, they're just, there's nothing really else in there. So, I mean, the main takeaways are that they're really trying to make a push for somebody to come forward. They do have DNA. I've heard a couple rumor mill type things about what happened at the scene, but totally unverified stuff. So I won't be saying that. Um, there is, um, you know, the father, uh, I don't know if he did it intentionally, but he let out that both kids were shot at point blank range, range and multiple times. The other police chief or whoever that first guy was said that, um, or I think the second speaker, he said that the purse, um, lanyard, cell phone, credit cards, um, all everything that she owned was gone. And that's interesting. So that stuff's out there somewhere. Okay. All right. And then I, I did have another thing I was going to talk about. So this case... You know, they are working on it. Hopefully, it'll lead to something soon. Now, I don't know if any of you guys saw this today, but this actually is very similar to a case that um, that I worked on a while ago. There's a, in New York, it's not, I don't know what, when you say, when I say case, um, an elevator this guy right here got into an elevator and it was going down and then he stepped off the elevator and it still was going down and he got crushed. There were still five people on the elevator and he got dragged to the ground between the elevator and the wall and he got crushed. Okay, And everybody in the elevator watched him slowly die uh, because he was pinned in there and I know exactly uh, this this is the th I actually worked professionally on two cases related to elevator deaths okay um, what's what's cool is in the article here let me see if he's in this one yeah. hold on let me see if I can find that one I, I think I misplaced it though just a second second I have to go find it so I think it's on Facebook somewhere I don't know if it's in a private conversation let me see if I can find it oh yeah just about Oh, that's so good. That's unfair. Phenomenal. Oh, wow. That's so unfair. Well, hold on. Now I gotta watch Come the on, Jake. Yeah, this is crazy. So this is new here. Mechanic sentenced to jail time in horror elevator accident. Oh, that's the old one. That's my the one that I did. This is the case I worked on right here. This is the one with Deborah Jordan. This guy got he got um, I think it was up to four years for assault. 
And he ended up getting only, I think it was three months or something like that. But it's the first conviction of its kind where this guy turned off the safety mechanism, bypassed it, where if you're on an elevator, the doors cannot be open and the elevator move at the same time. However, if you're working on an elevator, you can bypass it to test things. Okay, but this idiot didn't even put cones out or anything. And this lady right here got onto the elevator and it drug her arm and her leg up all the way to the top of the... She, she happened to be in a hospital at the time. That's the only reason she's still alive, okay? And I made a video on this one. Let me see if I... I don't know if you guys... Most of you probably haven't seen it, but... Let's see. I think it's in here somewhere. Is it this one? Or, let's see. What would I have called that? Oh, yeah, now there's so many videos now. Oh, there it is right there. Okay. So this is a case I actually worked professionally on in New York. And this is Deborah Jordan right there. And I think this is her daughter, I believe. Um, and this is all the surveillance footage looked like. So I filled it in the gaps to make it smooth looking because we, we figured out what happened. She explained what happened. So watch what happens. She, the, the elevator door opens up. This guy walks out and then she steps on and this is what happened. The elevator went up like that and it went, and man, it was, it's just sick as hell. But like, this is how it looked like from inside. It kind of creates like a guillotine. Right, so she steps on, and then it just goes boom, and then she got dragged up all the way, and then her hand got stuck, too, like right there, see that? Her hand got stuck there, too, and it was dragging down, and between, there's like a little tiny gap, only about a half inch, and that's where her whole leg was pulled up through that, all the way up to the eighth floor, and she got, um, you know, she did live, but she almost died and she was in a coma for like a month because as soon as they took the pressure off by moving the elevator, it was kind of acting as a tourniquet, she almost bled out completely. But miraculously, this happened in a hospital, right? So that's, that's a, a real case, and, but we won. It was cool. The jury actually said the video really helped them see what the hell happened and how irresponsible this idiot was, okay? So, hold on, I'm still looking for that uh, the video. Is this it right here? No, not yet. I was having a conversation with somebody, my friend Ada, actually. A oh, man crush, is that the one? Hmm. Yeah, well, anyways, I can't find the video, but the way the video looked was the guy, one guy in front of him got out, then the next guy came out, he tried to get out, and then his, both of his legs went up, and then his head's up there, and it just goes, you can't, I mean, these people are just, they bury their heads in their, um, their head in their hands, and they're just freaking out as they walk by, okay, um, let's see, let's see if I can find it. It's also in New York again. And this guy, I think he spent, he, uh, I think it was like 3,800 a month for the rent in the damn place. I'm trying to find that video though. I don't know if I have it. If anybody out there has it, go ahead and put it in there. But. Uh, I don't seem to be able to find it right away. I just thought of this at the last minute, so. Yep, I do not see it. I'll try one more place. Yeah, that was that one.
Oh, okay. Yeah, so in this one article, let, let me see, I'm almost, almost have it here. It's just a little bit up here. There it is. Okay, got it. So here we go. Hey, it's Raquel Bedgood Corley. The one and only We Are Freaks. She'll always be first, a, a person in the real world wearing that shirt. All right, here we go. Look, here, there's, this is it right here. Watch. See, this guy gets out, and then look. I mean, he just, you know. Look at, look at everybody uh, walking around, just absolutely horrified, every single one. It, they're going to have a huge lawsuit here. And this lady turns right at the wrong time. She just happens to see that part. And look at these people. They just, they're like, oh, God. It's horrible, right? Now, one of the things that's interesting in here is the guy that got a hold of me to do this. He's right here, Kevin Doherty. He's the guy that got a hold of me to do the New York case before, and he's the expert in there. As soon as I read above, above where it said an expert, I kind of knew that was going to be him. And there he was. He was explaining. And here's the thing is the odds of that happening, ac happening accidentally by some weird mechanical error are like one in a million. Almost impossible, right? Because there's actually two different things. Like if, if the back door is open, it can't move. If the side door is open, it can't move. However, if you do the bypass, it will move. And, it, and the thing is, is there's cones next to the other elevator. So you kind of wonder, was there somebody else there? That elevator had been having problems, the other elevator, and it had been fixed in May. And now there's elevators there again. Uh, I mean, cones there again. So then you wonder, was the guy in there, was somebody in there that day trying to fix that elevator and put the bypass on the wrong elevator? I think it's going to be something like that, all right? But, man, it's horrible. And there, the laws on elevator, that's the whole point of that case in New York that I was involved in was to get more regulations. They don't even, they weren't even regulating anything. You could just get some weird mechanic out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll fix it. Yep, yeah, I got it. it. It was ridiculous, all right? Okay, so... I did want to show you guys that. I thought that was kind of interesting. and It, it actually hit home with me. And it was, it's weird because even the same elevator expert is in the articles. I guess I, I actually called him today on the phone. And he said he'd been called five or six times by trying to get interviews with him. I've already got rid of that. I'm not going to play it again. I might do it on another show, slow it down or something. But... It sucks. Uh, if you go on to like Live Leak and then type in like, you know, look at Chinese in China, their elevator, they just, it's horrific crap going on over there. Unbelievable stuff. Just really, just, it's, it's horrifying. Hey, thanks, Cairo. I must have been through Streamlabs. No, no, it's right there. I see. Wow, that was that was actually before it, you it even showed up. That was I hate that PPL think you just do YouTube when you actually work on cases in real life. Yeah, now well, they I guess they don't know about those ones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, everybody gets sued. The people who, who hired the mechanic, the hospital. De Deborah Jordan, the case I worked on, that was a criminal case, but she had already got her settlement for the civil case, and it was quite large. It wasn't some minuscule thing, but she could never use her leg. Uh, I actually always thought maybe she should have let her leg... Um, go i mean to be honest with you they, they had to reconstruct the whole thing made out of you know it's, there's hardly even any bone left in it it's just sort of 
it doesn't really even work. She probably wouldn't even be in as much pain without it. You know what I mean? I guess it'd be hard to make that decision, though. Yeah, it's like four or five years old in that video. Well, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, when I'm into a case and I do my animations and stuff, I'm only going to do the animation if I believe in the theory, too. I, I can't do it. Um, you know, when people go, yeah, so look at it. This is what I think happened. And then when I look at it and I put everything and line it up and I can't make that happen logic with, with the facts, then I'll just say, hey, you know, I can't make it do what do that. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll see what happens in that one. Um, I'll probably... Um, I'll get the video on there and play it again at some point. Slow it down. And <clears throat> I don't know. I did tell the guy, I said, hey, if you ever, you know, I've done one before. If you need me to make an animation on this one, let me know. I can kind of see what happened. That one's... It's not totally clear because there's somebody standing there, but you can kind of see what happened. His legs were up, and then it just pulled him down. It's really... When me and my wife get out of elevators after working on that case, we just leap out. Like, there isn't... We don't sit there and... Uh, lollygag and get in line and sort of try to try to get out if you when you get out of an elevator everybody just zip out do not waste time because that thing moves you're probably not going to live it is crazy shit and you can see it's like a moving guillotine i know it's sort of paranoid in a way because you know it's sort of like flying planes right i mean it almost always is safe Except for the time it's not. Yeah, well, that's the thing is my video allowed the jury to actually see what was going on. And, and I actually based it on her description. She said her left leg was, let's see, what was it? Her left leg, yeah, her right leg was underneath her left leg, kind of like when you do a stretch on your, um, I don't know, like half Indian style kind of. And it got cr pulled down too as it's getting pulled up. And then she reached down to try to get her leg out and then her arm got stuck between the same gap. It's crazy. But she lived, this guy did not live. The other case I worked on was, um, I think it's in Texas, where an elevator, a guy was there to fix the elevator, and then while the elevator was turned off, and then some idiot turned the elevator back on again, and somebody called the elevator, and he had his um, head in the shaft looking down, and the, the counterbalance weight came down and went bang right on his head, just, and his head just basically exploded and pulled him down, to the bottom of the um, elevator shaft. I, I've seen all the photos of that one. It's nuts. That one, I never, I never had to make a full animation or anything like that. But on that one, I worked with surveillance footage a lot too. Um, we were kind of watching some of these guys walking around. Um, the guy that noticed the what happened. It was he, you know, who turned the elevator back on again. <clears throat> yeah, that would have thrown me for a loop there, super mean Sadie. I wouldn't have known what the hell you were talking about. One in a million, you say. Yeah, that's right. Huh? I mean, you don't hear of this happening all the time, right? So imagine how many people rode elevators until it happened again. Uh, one, there was a case in New York where 
a lady was getting out and she got cut in half and the other person had to sit in the elevator looking at the upper body of the killed person or one of the halves right you're sitting in there for i mean that must be so traumatizing i don't know what else to you know how else to um, describe it i know what you're seeing on the screen has nothing to do with anything all right so right now i'm going to switch over to these cold cases all right you guys ready to do something else So this is one in Indiana. And this is 1978, cold case, hasn't been solved. All right, so look at this, these young Speedway murder victims. Um, they actually live near a friend of mine. Uh, friends and relatives of four slain burger chef employees today characterize the victims as good-natured, hardworking young people who had earned a position of trust in the Speedway chain restaurant. Still stunned and choked with emotions by the news of the slang, family members and acquaintances supplied the news with details of the victims' lives. Okay, so, you know, this goes through and explains all of them. Uh, the victims are uh, Ruth Shelton, she was 17, Daniel R. Davis, 16. Jane C. Freet. I don't know if it's F-R-I-D-T. So maybe Freet, something like that. And then Mark Flemons. Okay, now it turns out that there might be something related to the case regarding this Mark Flemons here. But let me uh, go over the details of what happened here. I mean, these are just massive articles, too. I mean, they... <laughs> Man, it's almost, like, too blurry at this point. Let me see if I can zoom out this couple spots. Yeah, well, basically what happened was, I'll just explain it to you, was the all four of these people were working at the uh, Burger Chef restaurant, and it, it had closed... And then somebody came in there and abducted all four of them. And then all four of those people were driven to a location about 15 miles away. And it could have been even as much as 24 hours later that they were driven there. And they were all killed there. Two of them were shot in the back and one of them was stabbed multiple times, and the other one was bashed in the head, uh, died of blunt force trauma. It's crazy. And this one, this still hasn't been solved, but I think they might know who had done it. Uh, the bodies of four young persons abducted Friday night from a Burger Chef restaurant at 5725 Crawfordville Road. And I do have that, just a second. It's not a Burger Chef anymore. It actually closed down, and it looks like it's one of those places that goes in and out of business all the time. Like even when you look at Street View here, there's no signage it's out of business right and it looks like <laughs> i've never seen that before where they just redact the name of the uh the business that's what it looks like a redaction all right uh, the four all of whom were employed at the restaurant were jane freak at the uh, let's see and it, she was the assistant manager okay and uh, I guess I could pull show you guys a closer look so this is her right there right this is Daniel um, let's see what's his name Daniel oh crap 
Oh, I almost turned off the... Uh... So it's Jane C. Freak, 20, Ruthie Shelton, Daniel Davis, and Mark Flemons. And it's F-L-E-M-M-O-N-D-S. He was 16. So the ages were Freak was 20, Ruthie Shelton was 17, Daniel R. Davis is 16, and Mark Flemons was 16 as well. So they're just young kids working at a restaurant. It's probably no different than working at like Dairy Queen or something like that, right? So here we go. It says at least two of the victims were shot in the head, according to police. So they were shot from behind, almost execution style. They, they were found face down. The bodies were discovered adjacent to a private driveway in a hilly wooded area about a half mile south of County Road 700. So that, that's actually a better description. I, I was looking at other places. I couldn't find it. Let's see if we can maybe find this. Wooded area about a half mile south of County Road 700 north. Well, that's hard because you don't know what the cross street is, so forget it. They told police they saw no one enter the private gravel road leading to their home any, any time over the weekend. Police refused to identify the couple who lo located the bodies. The bodies were taken to Johnson County Memorial Hospital at Franklin. Um, so, I mean, it's amazing how this story for a long time kept being covered over and over and over again. And they just couldn't really ever get a, um, you know, find out who the hell did it. And I think they have DNA. So I, I think they should bust this case back out again. Um, there's been some stuff that's come out of the last few years. And there's even one of the uh, images has Carter from the Delphi cases in there. I thought that was kind of weird. But I guess he's a superintendent of the surrounding area there, so. Now there's gotta be, this is 1978 though, that's the problem. Let me move on to different articles here. So look at this one. The four were held 24 hours before slangs. The Indiana Restaurant Association announced today it's establishing a reward. Okay. Um, so we haven't got to... Let me see where... The, the bodies of four Jane C. Free 20. Uh, the news has learned that authorities believe the four who were taken from the Burger Chef where they worked between 11 p.m. Friday and 12.15 a.m. Saturday, were held hostage before they were taken to the secluded area in Johnson County to be killed in the pre-dawn hours of Sunday. I mean, what a freaking nightmare that must have been. And they think there's up to three people that did this. Sources close to the investigation have also disclosed it is believed it was Miss Freet who drove her car from the Burger Chef to a point about one and a half blocks from the Speedway police station where it was abandoned. Oh, boy. Wow. So that means they had her in the car and they told her to drive probably to where another car may have been located, maybe a van of some sort, right? And they might know that because her fingerprints might be determined to be on the steering wheel on top or maybe the only finger, you know, fingerprints. I don't know how they were able to determine that. Investigators said Miss Freet was very conscientious about always locking the doors to her car and insisted passengers in her car locked their door when they got out. When the car was found, sources said, the driver's door was locked, but the passenger door was unlocked. Huh, that's interesting, right? Like she just did it out of habit, and that guy didn't give a damn what she said. The keys of the car were found in Miss Freed's left coat pocket, sources said. All right, so they think that she probably drove, and an unknown person got out 
of the car out of the passenger side. State police investigators theorized the person who rode in the passenger seat was not a close friend because... See, I, I actually hadn't even read this part yet. yet. I was just cutting out clips and uh, headlines. And uh, wow, so that's crazy. The person who rode in the passenger seat was not a close friend because the door was not locked. Sources also said cash was found in one of Miss Freed's pockets. State police also said they have developed a new witness who may have information about the abandon, abandonment of Ms. Reed's car. Sources close to the investigation also said three possible witnesses were to be placed under hypnosis before working with police artists in the creation of composite sketches, at least two suspects. Huh. Hypnosis, man. I'm sure, are they going to get out the... Uh, Spirit box, too, or? Please help. Uh, okay, let me let me see. I think I do have the next page of this. Maybe not, though. Uh, in the rear of the building was a heavy metal door with a plaque with white lettering. No deliveries accepted between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Through the door had come the killers. Through the door, Jane Freed, 20, Ruth Ellen Shelton, 17, Mark Flemons, and Daniel Davis, both 16, were abducted and taken to their deaths in a wooded area in Johnson County. Driving east on Crawfordville Road inside the boundary set by I-465, the incorporated community of Speedway, last night looked pretty much as usual. Um, let's see. Yeah. I'm just, I found like literally, I mean, look at all these articles right here. Tons of them. And then I skipped through the years. I ended up in um, all the way up into 2018. So that's the other one held for 24 hours. State police are, uh, police are back at playing their who's on first game. And again, the public is losing. Trooper James Kramer. This is August, uh, excuse me, uh, let's see, March 20th, 1981. So about three years, two and a half years later. Carmichael said this week he is area coordinator and is in charge. Carmichael hustled to the Marion County Jail to interview a man Kramer had said earlier might have some information valuable to him in the investigation. The man is James Freak, uh, his br uh, brother of one of the murder victims, Jane Freak. Freak is being held on a cocaine dealing charge. So they actually thought, gosh, maybe it was payback for something to do with James Freak. But then the police believed him by when he said, oh, yeah, um, yeah, I have nothing to do with it. So they just believed him. A Marion County Sheriff's Detective Friday reported a possible break. This is from 1983. All right, so you're looking at uh, November 19th, 1983, so about five, over five years later. A Marion County Sheriff's Detective Friday reported a possible break in the five-year-old Burger Chef murder case in which four restaurant employees were slain. The bodies of four who were abducted from a Burger Chef restaurant in Speedway, November 17, 1978, were found by hikers two days later in a heavily wooded area about 200 yards from Stones Crossing Road by about a mile west of Center Grove High School. Oh, well, now we can actually I can find this place. All right. Let's see. So here we go. That, that was a pretty good description right there. So Center... 
Grove High School. Okay, so that's Center Grove High School. <laughs> Look at that, I've never seen that before. Elementary school, middle school, high school, all right, lumped right next to each other. Okay, so I'm gonna put that there and then go back to the article. And it said, heavily wooded area about 200 yards from Stones Crossing, about a mile west of Center Grove High School. All right, so let's see. 200 yards from Stones Crossing. All right. And what does it say again? It said... Two hundred yards from Stones Crossing Road, about a mile west. Okay, so I bet you it's a mile west of the school. So let's do this. Here we go. That's a mile there, approximately. So it's right at that intersection. And then... See, it doesn't look today how it looked back then. We know that. So maybe like 200 yards from there. Yeah, so something like that, right? So there's the high school. Actually, hold on. Which one was the high school again? Just a second. I think I might need to be north, not there. Sorry. Ah, come on. Where is it? Okay, 1983, 1119. <laughs> this is crazy. It's like I can't open up the. Uh... Wow, is that a right? Oh, it's way over there. Okay. Wow, no wonder. So Stones Cross, it was called, um, excuse me, Center Grove High School. All right. So that might have been north. Oh, no, it's down here. Okay, so that is the right one. So over here, a mile. Uh, let's make sure I got that right. A mile west of Center Grove High School, but it's also 200 yards from Stones Crossing Road. So this is Stones Crossing Road, 200 yards, and then that would make it west of there almost exactly. Okay, so let's see what this place looked like as far back as we can on here. So as you can see, even then, so this is... 2018 but let's see what it looks like 1998 yeah definitely more rural I don't see you know any woods or anything like that let's see what street view looks like yeah so who knows you know it could have been this whole area right here 20 years prior and actually it could be maybe out in this wooded area right there but maybe 20 years prior, there was even more woods there. Okay, because this uh, Google Earth only goes back to 1998. All right. 
Marion County Sheriff Sergeant Leon or Leonard Field said a jail inmate has told authorities he served prison time with a man who admitted committing the murders. Field said the inmate spoke of a man who described himself as an enforcer or collector. See, this story has some weight to it. Um, it there's a common theme throughout the years. A collector for a drug dealer. According to the inmate, the enforcer and the two other men walked into the restaurant to demand payment of a drug debt from one of the employees. When another of the employees recognized one of the three men, the tale, the tale went they decided to kill all four youngsters. Fields said the man named as the Slayer still is in a prison, but he declined to say where. Uh, he withheld the names of the inmate and the suspect. Two of the four victims were shot in the head, and one was stabbed, and the fourth, who police believe could have struggled with the assailants, was beaten unconscious and asphyxiated on his own blood, police said. The victim, uh, so he basically drowned in his own blood. The victims all were working at the restaurant when they were abducted. The victims were Jane Free. You know, we've gone all through all those a million times. Uh, he said the theory that the drug trade was involved in the killings is consistent with a theory developed earlier in the case. But at this point, I don't think that we can prove any one of the theories. All right. So now we're moving ahead to 1987, which is about nine years later. Burger Chef case has new suspect. Police have a firm suspect in the murder of four young Burger, Burger Chef restaurant employees, a state police officer says. I'm not going to say it. Um, will be tomorrow, the arrest is what he's referring to, will be tomorrow or next week, but there's no doubt that it will happen, said Trooper James B. Kramer. Investigators said Wednesday one of the four victims around uh, slain victims found slain in Johnson County nearly two years ago owed Speedway drug pusher $7,000. Okay, you see that? So this is four years after that last article. And look how this is similar. So it says investigators said Wednesday one of the four victims found slain in Johnson County near nearly two years ago um, so how could that be two years ago? This is 1987. Investigators said Wednesday, one of four victims found slain in Johnson County nearly... Huh. That doesn't, that, that doesn't jive up with the date up there. Uh, anyways. Police said Mark Fleming, 16, was the employee allegedly involved with the pusher. So this Fleming's guy, he might have owed up to $7,000... And Flemons, uh, let's see, Flemons had been brutally beaten. See, there's a difference in how they were killed. You know, two of them were sort of, you know, quote, humanely killed. And then one of them was stabbed a bunch of times, and then the other one was beaten. Almost like he was tortured, beaten to try to get the money out. And he didn't have it. And they're all just, they all died. And maybe the other four were kind of kept around for leverage to try to get him to say something, but he wouldn't do it. Flemons had been brutally beaten, Miss Freet stabbed, and Miss Shelton and Davis shot in the head. Kramer, Trooper Donovan, Lindsay, and Annapolis Police Sergeant John Rubin, who have been investigating the slaying since November, said Flemons was afraid of the pusher. Lindsay said Flemons had told an associate the day before the crime that he didn't pay the man back he might be killed. The investigators said they knew who the drug pusher was. We know who he is, and we are seeking all of the information we can gather about him from every law enforcement agency in the state. Investigators also said the, uh, the interviewed, they interviewed an eyewitness who claimed he saw Miss Shelton in a car on Crawfordsville Road as she was being abducted from the restaurant. They said the witness was able to provide additional details about the car. With this information, we will be busy for several weeks, but we are not going to stop the investigation, 
We will never stop looking for the for these kids' killers. So that was 1987. I think this part up here where it said two years ago is off. And this is 1988 here. Oh, yeah. So let's go through this. This is an actual timeline that was put in the newspaper. I mean, look at this. So this will just tell us the whole damn story up until 1988, right? All right. And November 8, 1978, an off-duty employee discovered a back door open at Burger Chef Restaurant at 5725 Crawfordville Road. Okay, later that morning, police discover a car of missing Burger Chef assistant manager, Jane Freet, 20, parked one, uh, let's see, one and a half blocks from Speedway Police Department, uh, from Speedway Police Department, Speedway Police initially believe the workers may have taken the money themselves and made it appear like a robbery. See, at that time, they weren't sure what the hell was going on. A White River, so on November 19th, 1978, a White River Township couple walk, walking on their property off Stones Crossing Road discovered the murdered bodies of Burger Chef employees Freet, Ruthie Shelton, Donald R. Davis, and Mark C. Flemons. Police from several agencies converge on the scene Later that night, large press conference occurs. Then Johnson County Prosecutor Charles Gantz does not allow police to answer many questions. Boy, doesn't that sound familiar. Then just two days later on November, actually just one day later, on November 20th, 1978, intensive multi-agency investigation involving dozens of detectives begins. Johnson County Sheriff detectives are not included in the investigation. November 22nd, so two days after that, investigators release sketches of two men seen in the Burger Chef parking lot late Friday, November 17, 1978. An Indianapolis newspaper starts an anonymous letter writing campaign to get information about the case. I've actually seen the, um, there's some, uh, I don't know, you, what do you call it? The clay renditions of what the people might have looked like, and there's some sketches. No, there. Well, the next thing says, clay busts of two suspects are <laughs> unveiled by police. All right, that was November 24th. Then, December 3rd, 1978, a former Indianapolis resident held in Cincinnati is considered a suspect. He is later cleared. December 5th, 1978, anonymous letter writer to the Indianapolis Star says three people were involved in the murders. The writer never contacted police despite a public plea to do so. Hmm, that's interesting. All right, so hold on a second. I gotta get, get some uh, water. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> it is Friday. Maybe I'll have a drink after. Well, forget it. The problem is, is when you drink Gatorade and then you try to have like a scotch or something, it absolutely ruins the, uh, the taste. And it takes a long time for the Gatorade to sort of disappear. You know? All right. So December 3rd, 1978, a former Indianapolis resident. Held in Cincinnati, uh, we just went over that part. Considered a suspect, he's later cleared. And then we're going through the anonymous letters. Detectives received their first days off since the murder. That was December 24th. 
and 25th, so Christmas time. Christmas Eve and Christmas. Uh, February 7th, 1979, a man jailed in Anderson looks like a good suspect, but again, he's later cleared. March 6, 1979, and by the way, this is the, the Daily Journal from Franklin, Indiana, November 17th, 1988. Okay, so March 6, 1979, state police suspect three men involved in a series of fast food restaurant holdups who are reported drug users. They are not arrested. March 13, 1979, police check to see if Roger Dale Stafford, arrested on a charge of killing six people at an Oklahoma restaurant, was in Speedway the night of the Burger Chef killings. He is later eliminated as a suspect. So late April 1979, two men arrested for double murder in Milwaukee enter suspect pool. They are later ruled out. November 15, 1979, State Police Superintendent John Shettle, that's, the, that's what um, Carter is right now, right? So he's, a, he's the uh, police superintendent, conducts a disastrous news conference on the first anniversary of the crime. Shettle appears not to know many details of the case, and he admits there are no solid suspects in the crime. <laughs> Nothing worse. You know what that reminds me of? The Delphi press conference, the one that was prior to the last one. Remember when the new uh, prosecutor got up there? He didn't have a clue about the case. He, he didn't know what the hell was going on. He, I mean, the guy that took over Ives' position. He got out there, and man, it was like, whoa! What, what, what you know? <laughs> Try to learn a couple things. It's, it reminds me a little bit of, the, of these YouTubers, right? Who get up there, and they, they're all excited to go make a quick little video, but they really didn't uh, figure out any of the actual facts of the case before making the video. But unfortunately, on YouTube, that's acceptable and, and, and appreciated by people. It's weird. Uh, January 4th, 1980, uh, reports show that eight months earlier, Indiana State Police Detective Ken York of Franklin and other detective approached Gantz to issue warrants for two Johnson County men for the, crime, for the crimes. Gantz declined, saying he needed more solid evidence. <laughs> January 11th, 1980, York and Indiana State Police Detective Richard Bumps, a Johnson County resident, are appointed to a new task force formed to investigate the murders. February 1980, Greenwood man termed a strong suspect. He was cleared. June 1980, task force disbands. No arrests were made by the force. October 1980, state police investigator predict Burger Chef arrests will occur soon. March 12, 1981, former Morgantown resident James W. Freet, the brother of murder victim Jane Freet, arrested in Indianapolis on cocaine charge. Six days later, state police said Freet has no connection to the 1978 murders. Here's the thing, everybody. Like in the early 80s, cocaine was like pot now. Like it was everywhere. You know, you go to these parties. I never, I've never done coke, but you know, my brother did, and that that was in his system. They don't really know exactly if that's what uh, he didn't have much in his system, and that might have made his heart beat funny, and and he died. But um, you know, that's the thing is, uh, it was all over the place. Like you go to these parties, and people just be walking around, you know, with mirrors and shit. It was, it was stupid. And I don't think it's anything like that now, but back then it was just everywhere, all the time. Okay, state police investigator predict Burger Chef arrest will occur soon. All right. And then they talked about uh, Freet's brother. Uh, and then September 4th, 1983, authorities in Kilgore, Texas, discover a multiple murder similar to the Burger Chef murders. November 19th, 1983, a uh, bank robbery suspect tells police he knows man, he knows man who admits 
he did the slangs. Late December 1984, so a whole year after that, former Johnson County resident Donald Wayne Forrester contacts an Indianapolis Star reporter. Forrester was serving a 95-year prison sentence for rape. Contends he has knowledge about Burger Chef case. Marion County investigators and Marion County prosecutor's office begin working with him. November 14, 1986. Published reports say Forrester reportedly confessed November 9th to killing Shelton and Davis. Forrester reported they reportedly received immunity from prosecution for his help in the case. Well, why would he <laughs> why would you give him immunity? November 17, 1986, Forrester recants his confession. Marion County investigators continue their attempt to build a case against Forrester despite the recantation. Then on December 22, 1986, Marion County Prosecutor Stephen Goldsmith announces Forrester will not be charged with the case. He tells reporters he doubts if anyone will ever be prosecuted for the murders. March 1988, slides of the Burger Chef murder scene taken by former ISP evidence technician W. Cheryl Alspach turn up missing. Ah, oh, Jesus. They surface at New Whiteland Police Department. How'd that happen? Later determined that former New Whiteland deputy Bruce Pettijohn had gotten slides out of a trailer Alspach owned. Pettijohn cleared of any wrongdoing. Slides are returned to Alspach. Huh. That seems kind of weird. November 1988, ISP James Kramer says he hopes a new $1.8 million computer that identifies fingerprints can find a match to a fingerprint from a murder investigation to a suspect. So far, the computer hasn't found a match. November 1988, Developments continue, continues of a subdivision built on the land where the murder victims were found. Development continues of a subdivision. Huh. So let's see if we can, yeah, you know, like maybe this area right here, right? Would you consider that a subdivision? This area? I mean, this definitely looks like a subdivision there. Huh. I wonder if it's actually right over here and they're just off by the mile. And, you know, maybe they measure from the middle of the school and that would put you here. I, I don't know. But perhaps it's in this area. Let's actually just take a look at the historical view of that area just for the hell of it. Well, there you go. Look at that. 1998, there is nothing here. So look at that entire area in 1998. So this is even 10 years after that, that, what they just mentioned right there, right? So look at that. So then you go all the way to what it looks like now and this complete huge subdivision right there. So maybe it's in this area. And, they, and then let's say back another 10 years, there were more, uh, eight, you know, maybe some more trees. Perhaps it's even like in this clump right there, something like that. It's hard to say, really. Yeah, $1.8 million computer. Wow. You could buy a 1,000 computers now for that amount and probably do a th a way better, too. Uh, that's okay, Beth. I, I, I'm trying to... Let's see. So hopefully it's in that area right there because they said a mile west of the high school and then 200 yards that way. All right, November 1988. Yeah. Yeah, I saw those pictures earlier, Beth, the same ones. And that's, that's what makes it kind of hard. I've already got the picture of the, 
I showed the street view of where the uh, the actual um, restaurant was. It doesn't look like it does now, but the building looks the same. It's just right here. I wish you could do street view back in time, but you know, if you go down to there and so the building looks the same. It still has that same look to it. Uh, it just it's probably been sold, got out of business, sold, got out of business. It's even out of business right now in this shot. Okay, so that's what that looks like. And, you know, the street that they were found on, I, I saw it earlier, it does have some trees on it and there's a road, right? The, the problem is, is we don't know what it looked like there in 1977. Yeah, I saw that one too, the one of the crime scene. They were walking around with metal detectors. Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, yeah so th there's, a, there's a, like a dirt road that they had back then. All right, so all we can really do is go based, based on what, how they ex described it, a mile west of the high school, right? A mile west of the high school, which is right there, and then 200 meters from Stone Crossings Road. Okay, the, the problem is, is that was 1978, and everything looks different now. I mean, it's right, right there, actually. This is where I guessed the bodies were found. See this place where I have the, um, the pin? That was just off of this huge map in, in the paper, and they put a pin there. Okay, the other information that we just got, I could see that being close, because it was about this high up in the air where it put the pin. So... That is very close to this one. So if I put this here, this is the description area that they gave us. And we don't know, you know, where the gravel road is because that was 1978. That's the problem. But yes, uh, I mean, the pictures that she um, had, let me show you what she just had right here. So these are guys looking around with um, metal detectors, right? So it looks like there's a little bit of a hilly area there. There's also... Um, this little dirt road and the cars on there. These are ones that are in different articles. That's what the Burger Chef restaurant looked back like back then. Okay. Yeah, that's the the problem. Though we're going to have is that we're looking at images. Even the earliest image on Google Earth is 20 years after the crime. Okay, and back in the back in 1978, a lot of roads are gravel out in this area. Okay, now it looks like a lot of them are paved and we're not going to be able to really determine. It could have been like right here, right? I mean, who knows? Maybe just right off of this road right here. And look, that doesn't even have street view, unfortunately. Uh, the closest street view is way over there. So it's possible that since that's pretty close, uh, maybe that little road that they're looking at is like right there right there and maybe back there a little bit and then there's a little rise or something. Um, yeah. All I can say is it's somewhere around in this area right there. Now, if I want to be more broad, I'd say in this area for sure. Yeah. But that was very specific. That was a pretty good description saying one mile west of the high school and 200 meters from, uh, actually earlier I meant over in this area right there. So 200 meters from Stones Crossing Road, 200 yards, and a mile west of the high school. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the mile isn't, well, it's 1.2, but who's counting, huh? Well, that's the thing is that's what we rely on is being having things accurately described but unfortunately, a lot of times, you don't get it like that. Yeah, I mean, look, at, I'm just going to show you again. Look at the landscape just in, in 1998. Say, I'm going to go like this, and then let's just watch over time as it changes. So that's 2003. Let's go back. 1998. And look at, in 2003, a ton of developments going on. You can even see that the ground's dirt. They're getting ready to start building homes. Then we move forward a little bit. Uh, this is May 2004. 
August 2004. Now there's actually some homes being built in there. Little boxes. Yeah, so. Yeah, I'm just going to keep going over the story. There's a lot more to it. I mean, it, do you have, you have extra information on the story? I mean, I get that you live there, but what advantage does that have? Um, do you have information on the story, though? Gorby. Like, really good insight. Because I got more to go here. I'm not, not even... Um, I just ended at 1988 in the timeline that, was found, that I found in the paper. And look at about 19, 2006, almost all those homes are put in there. And then it just keeps getting more and more and more. This area here stays pretty uh, similar. So I'm kind of thinking that it's over in this area, closer to here, because they did say that there's been a, a development built there. And this area here all looks kind of the same, although, again, we don't know what it looked like 20 years prior to that. Okay, well, I don't want to go over that, you know, speculation stuff like that, but let me go over um, on the rest of this stuff. So this one's in 1993. Hey, it's Kit Kat. How you doing, Kit Kat? <laughs> All right, you, you go for it, Cairo. You get that figured out, huh? Miss DR guys, hugging face. Yeah, but maybe after I go over it at the end, I'll take um, some calls. Sound good, Gorby? Yeah. What year, Gorby? Is it in the paper, your story? With your name and everything, so we can go check it out? Yeah, so a year later, okay. That's a, just going through the paper, that was really a dangerous, shitty place to live, I think, in 1979. <laughs> I mean, every time you look at a story, just next to it, there's another story of somebody being murdered and killed, bodies found, all over the place. And there's even another case from 1979 uh, that I was going to go over, but I don't know if I'm going to have time. So I might have to push that off into tomorrow. Yeah, no, it really was, uh, Beth. Sorry to, sorry to say. I just, every time you look in the paper, it's lots of murders. Now, you might have lived there and maybe you weren't, you know, like you're kind of young, so you're not going to be paying attention. But, um, you know, I think in 1978, I was 13, but man, it looked like, uh, <laughs> it's wild. If you go to their unsolved cases area, there's literally tons from 79 and 80 unsolved cases, murders. It's wild. I mean, I don't know if it's way more dangerous than any other big city though, but it just, it was amazing going through the articles. And right next to the story you're reading is another one that you start reading because it's crazy too. Right, you know, every, every place has good and bad areas, right? It's really obvious. All right, so here it is in 2003. See, here's that same picture that we just saw a second ago. See that? Wow, so it was really dangerous for a small city then. Wow, that's crazy. Countless tips never produced enough evidence for an arrest. A locker seven feet tall sits in Indiana State Police Post 52 filled with files from a single case. Another locker sits half full. Then there are... The individual files kept by countless investigators over the years. So much information, but no answers. 
After 25 years, the slayings of four Burger Chef workers remains unsolved. Mistakes may have doomed the investigation almost from the start, but relatives of those killed still hope a sudden revelation may uncover the killers. The latest in a long line of state investigation, ins, investigators plans to comb through the files one more time, but no officials contemplate launching an active probe again without something solid. Thanks, Claudia Neubauer. If this is ever solved after 25 years, Carolyn Freed said, it'll have to be deathbed confession. So much has changed. The Burger Chef chain no longer exists. The restaurant... Best the channel on YouTube. You beaming face with smiling eyes. Thumbs up. Light skin tone. <laughs> light skin tone. Hey, look at that. There's Woods Girl and Kids. Back from her... Her fishing trip. Yeah. So, anyways, the the the, bit, the the burger chains out of business. Hey, uh, freaks, listening while I unpack, Miss Yao. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like, here's those same pictures that I was talking about. They were they were going to show up later in my show, but you know, I gotta I gotta do what people say. Hey, Greg, Greg, have you seen this one? Have you seen this one? Okay, yeah, let me get loaded up. Okay, there it is. All right. So here's the guys with the metal detectors. There are no memorials at the building, nothing to show that it has any more history, history than any other stores or busy streets. The four restaurant workers. Hey, thanks, Sam. Must have been on Streamlabs. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, here's the thing. I guess I don't really know 100% like, wow, it was way, it was a really dangerous place to live. All I know is when I was reading, going through all the years of research on this, different stories, that there was just so much violence in the paper. But that's kind of what sells papers, right? So I guess it doesn't really matter where you live. That's just kind of what's going to be the main story. And the thing is, there were some bombings that went on, too, right around that same time. It's kind of weird. A lot of weird stuff going on. Um, a delivery man found the burger chef empty on the night of November 19th, 1978. So there was a guy, a delivery person that came by, and it wasn't, I think it was before midnight. Yeah, so it was at 10.15. The delivery man called to say the restaurant's back door was ajar. So it must have just closed. And then these guys came in and got them. <laughs> At the time, police thought Jane Freet, Ruth Shelton, 17, Daniel Davis, 16, and Mark Fleming, 16, had gone to a nearby under-20 club, even though the females had left their purses at the restaurant. Boy, that's some genius work there. Unaware they were investigating a brutal crime that would grip Indianapolis as few other as few others, police soon made the first critical mistake. Cleaning crews were allowed to get the restaurant ready for the next day's business. What a bunch of idiots. Destroying any clues that might have existed, which there would have been many. People began to grow worried after a day passed without a sign of the four young restaurant workers. One worker's car was found on West 15th Street, only a block and a half from Speedway. Let's see. So that's uh, West 15th Street. Speedway, Indiana. Okay, so there's the Burger Chef restaurant. And does that continue on? 
So how could it be only a block and a half? If it's right there, does it continue up like that? Let's see, car was found on West 15th Street. A lot of times they kind of continue on like that. I don't see how that can be a block away. Does it go over here somewhere? That's 25th. Speedway. That's West 18th. That doesn't make a lot of sense. They said it's a block and a half from the restaurant, right? Well, I mean, West 15th is right there. And maybe it continues somewhere. But I don't really see it anywhere near. There's West 15th Street going perpendicular to that. There. It's 18th, I mean. And then... Well, you know what? Who knows? Maybe they changed things around since then. I, I don't know. Anyways. Oh, from... Oh, sorry. I didn't say I that. I loved right. it. <laughs> I could have read the re re next sentence that said... 15th Street, only a block and a half from Speedway Police Headquarters. Okay, so let me try that again. So let me put a pin right there on that. No wonder that didn't make any sense. See? There we go. And that's probably exactly where the car was parked, right right around in this area right here. All right. I'll just put it right there. There we go. So that made sense. All right, so let's go. Police also discovered that about 500 had been taken from the restaurant office. On the second day, the bodies of the four workers were found in a wooded area of Johnson County, about 15 miles from the restaurant. Although houses dot the landscape today, it was an isolated rural part of the country in 1978. So I actually think it's in that development area that's what I think you're saying Lynnhurst is that what, is that what this name of this street is right here how come there's no name on there come on name that's where I had it originally but anyways, it's on this street right here. And if that's Lynnhurst right there, that's where I had to pin originally. But anyways, this is the street that the car was found on, and the police station is right over there. Unfortunately, it's uh, not putting a name on there. Well, that says, no, wait, that's the wrong street. Though. Is that a block and a half? Hold on. Now i got to do this again. Speedway Police Department. Am I backed up a little bit? So the block and a half. Let me do this again. I think I screwed up. Just a second. Speedway Police Headquarters. Only a block and a half from the Speedway Police Headquarters on West 15th Street. So I don't think I was even... This isn't 15th Street. This, this is right here. 
but that's the police station. So if you go this, a block and a half, maybe like here, something like that. Because that's West 15th going that direction. And then what was the name of that other street that you mentioned? There's a police station. Well, they said it was on West 15th Street, though, so it can't be right next to the school. I guess, I mean, I would put it either here or like right there. Although that is that Linher Street that you're talking about. Although I guess you could go the other direction too, right? Like block and a half this way. So if that's a block and a half, it could be something like that. So I guess based on the description, it could be here, here-ish, or like, well see, that's, I don't know if this is a block, like if that's a block, I think that is, I think that's an alley right there that you go behind, you can put your trash cans or something, let me see. Yeah, there's there's no street view on it. This looks like the like in the Fretwell case, you know the. Yeah, see, it's like a, just an alley. You can see it right back there. So it's an alley that you can you know put your trash out and get it picked up. So if you're a block and a half, that means these whole segments are blocks. So a block and a half would be. Right there, so a whole one of these here. So maybe like right there, something like that. Or it could be the other direction, right there, right? Or it could be, uh, I guess that's about the only option. If if it's true that it was on Linhurst Drive too. I didn't see that part. Yeah. yeah, I think it's right here where this is. All right. On the second day, of the bodies of four workers were found in a wooded area of Johnson County, 15 miles from the restaurant. According to investigators and autopsies, Freed had been stabbed in the chest. So she's the older person that's 20. Flemons had been beaten and apparently had tried to run from his attackers before running into a tree where he succumbed to his injuries. Shelton and Davis had been shot in the back, suggesting they might have been trying to flee as well. A second flaw in the investigation developed. The state police, Speedway police, and Johnson County deputies sparred over who would take the lead in the investigation, Dine said. All three departments could have claimed control of the case because evidence was discovered in each jurisdiction. For a while, state police concentrated on the killings and Speedway police investigated the restaurant robbery. At the time, tips began to flood in from the public, moved by, um, let's see, flood in from, uh, tips began to flood in from the public, moved by the brutality of the crime and the young victims. Dine remembers a tip that came in just after the victims disappeared. A man in a Greenwood Barr had bragged about being involved in the case. Police found him, and he told investigators that he had been shooting off his mouth about the involvement, but he claimed that there had been a group of four or five men who had been hiding behind trash containers, then robbing restaurants at gunpoint. That, in turn, had led to his investigation of the Franklin man. Or men. Anyways, this... Uh, <laughs> yeah told you wow yeah yeah Gorby sounds like one of those guys that wants likes to insert himself into a case you know like oh yeah 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 hey yeah hey, hey, i live two blocks from there that means i know everything about it all right 
Yeah. That's okay, Beth. I, I'm going to keep going through this stuff here. All right, so this is one in 2018. All right. They actually released a picture of the... Um, when Freed was stabbed, the blade broke off inside of her body. Okay, and here is the picture of the blade. It's only four and a half inches. So that's one of those really... I mean, that is one... What do you think? That's probably over an inch and a half tall, I would say. But it's a four and a half inch blade, and it broke off in her body. So they must have just... That person must have absolutely been just, um, you know, stabbing really hard, and it broke off. Yeah, see what I'm saying? That's what I was talking about. Look at look at Gorby now. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm just trying to cover the case and, and show everybody what I what I got off the um, newspapers.com and the internet. All right, just just different articles. All right, is that okay, Gorby? Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, you know them all. You were friends with all the victims. You got them all. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry about it, Gorby. You're, you're a little bit like that, too. You just keep blabbing away over and over again. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, doesn't that seem like a massive knife right there? It's not long, but it's really tall. It's crazy. So mean, Gorby. I know, I know. All right, don't worry. You'll get to um, you'll get to call in, Gorby, and get to explain your story. If uh, and that's that's what the call will be about, the story. Not well. See, I told you. See, I could see a minute ago when I read that part. I knew right when I read the part about there was other robberies in the area with groups of people. I was almost said, hey, that's what Gorby said, but I didn't because I knew you would jump in with see. Yeah, yeah, because that was known. That's known information that people in the area would have known. All right. So you got that. It's, it, there was a lot of different um, people that they thought was the suspect, but it turns out that you know they either recanted their confessions. I think the the theory about the drug debt owed makes a lot of sense. Because the other cases, people just robbed and they went on, right? This one involved killing four people. And it sounds like the police confirmed the $7,000 debt, right? See what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yes, Lanky Tour, we have really nice people. Right, right. You try, you're trying to relate other incidents, but maybe there's no connection at all, Gorby. You ever thought of that? Because I saw when I was reading through these articles, that's kind of what I'm referring to. There were other incidents of people being robbed at gunpoint, uh, but they just weren't able to make the connection. Yeah, maybe there is, but maybe there isn't too, right? But you're making it sound like there really is one. The way you're so animated and interested in it, you just Okay, I, w I mean, I wouldn't mind hearing your, your take on it, but uh, at the same time, you know, a little too into it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I had to say goodnight to the wife there. Oh, that's okay. I don't. You don't need to call in then. I, I'm not really that interested. Um, let's see. Definitely, we have a little family. That's right. We have a little bit of a family here. That's exactly right. Yeah, Crime Stoppers. That's a knife right there, though. That's the knife that was used, and it broke off inside Freet's body. Good night, Audra Blankenship.
I'm this old. Uh, let's see. No, I can't do YouTube videos. Yeah, I played this video earlier. I just can't do YouTube videos. They have the pictures of the clay. Well, here, here you go. Here's a, here's the clay faces, right? That's what. I mean, don't you recognize that guy? Yeah. These are the sketches that they made first. Now those look like real people. <laughs> Nightmare fuel. Hey, Gorby, you're, you're not an enemy on here, but just relax a little bit. That's just kind of the way stuff goes sometimes, you know? Um, sometimes I'm trying to get out the information that I have before I get really going down the, the rabbit hole conspiracy stuff that you're kind of, oh, yeah, well, this happened to me, this happened to me. Look at this. Look, 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 look. Okay, I just don't have time during the show to just stop everything and have Gorby call in, okay? So the thing is, is, I wouldn't mind if you called in, okay? If you want to discuss what you know. However, um, you know, just relax a little bit. You get what I'm saying? All right, so that uh, video that I was looking at earlier, but I can't play because it's YouTube. Maybe I can just pause it on the... Uh, this is the one that Beth uh, sent me again. So let's see. Is there any clear shots? Now. Okay, is there anything that looks like that in the road at all? Let's see. <laughs> no blood, no foul. All right. years after investigating this cold okay so there's kind of like this road and then a squirrely road over there let's see I'll have to do it off to the side so I can keep looking at it That's the thing, it's 1978 aerial, right? After investi <laughs> I'm just trying to see if there's anything that kind of resembles that. It was like that, and you're just kind of looking at it like, but now that road kind of has more of a sharp angle, like that. Hmm. 
Yeah, I don't know. I guess I could try to find some other ways to figure that out, but uh, probably not. Yeah, I guess I could do the older map, yeah. This is still 20 years after the fact, but it's probably closer, right? See, I think this is kind of like a main road over here, even though that even looks like it has a bend in it. Now let's, let's try something else. So they're saying a mile west of the high school and then 200 yards. I mean, they were so certain about the 200 yards part from, from the, this road. Yeah, I, don't, I can't go back more than 1998. I wonder if I go up higher, though. Can I... Okay, well, hold on. Okay, that, that's 1984 there. Except you lose it when you... It's not clear at all. So that's 1998. That's clear. And as soon as you go out to about there... You can go, that's 1992, but you can't make out the roads. Everything's too blurry. And then up here, you can go back to 1984. However, it's not, there's no, uh... Hey, good night, Nancy. Yeah, so this, this right here is only six years after. And if you zoom in, you can't see anything, really. So now we got April 1998. That's pretty clear for being that, that old, 21 years ago. So apparently in this area, let's see. Let me just, I'm gonna move it off to the side over here so I can. And see, it looks like there's um, kind of an opening, a wider area right there. Let me go back just slightly and see what happens. Now, years after investigating. What's right there? What's that there? Now, years. Oh, that's power lines right there. So let's see. There we go. All right. That might help out. They don't move those too often. And I see power lines. I saw power lines a few minutes ago when we were looking around. As a matter of fact, when I was in that one... There, hold on, let me go back up to this time frame to find those power lines. Where the hell was that? A minute ago, I had the power lines. They were blocked right there. So here you, here you got some power lines shooting across, right? There we go. So now we're over in this area. I mean, do you guys agree with that? They don't change power line locations too often, right? That's a huge hassle. You've got those big towers with the... Okay, so we did see one of the, the towers there. So let's see if we can uh, keep doing that. Because I definitely think that's what that was, right? No, so. Right no. there, this thing. Can you see that? Make that out? That looks like a tower, and that's the top of it. Right there. Now, years after... After investigating what do you what do you think does that look like a tower to you guys a um, power line tower I'm not sure if that's what you call them that I'm working off of now you right there okay well that gives a little bit of a uh, little help there Okay, so if that's what that is, and look, we, we're, get, we're close to the 200-yard thing. 
But how about this? Let's go 200 yards this way, and it runs into it about right there. And by God, I think that's what I was looking at a minute ago, this little... I, let's check this area, this right here, all right? Because it's got a little bit of a windy thing, something going on there. All right, hold on. Okay, this is what, this is what I'm thinking, maybe. Right here. Just like this, kind of. That that's right here. Um, watch what I'm doing here. Ah, crap. I wish I could get this smaller. Hold on. Let me see if I can do this. Right there. What do you think? What are you doing, Blue? Blue. He was just, Blue was just dreaming. Hey, Blue, it's okay, buddy. Hey, go get it, go get it. <laughs> wow, that was weird. I think this is it, though. What do you think? Look, let me get those power lines. See, the power line's right. Uh, that, the only thing that's not the same, though, is there's no power line. Like, as you go around this turn here, it looks like there's a power line in the inside like that would be right there if, if that was the. I don't know. I do think this might be the spot though, because it's really close to here, and you know it's not a mile. It's probably point eight. Let's see. Yeah, point eight exactly. Point eight zero. And that's the only thing that kind of looks like that. And see, the, the, that power line's on the inside of that curve there. So let's just keep looking at different things like that. How about this over here? I'm trying to keep the power line in, you know, in a shot there. <laughs> well, anyways, the best candidate so far is this one, but that's not exactly where I'm seeing the power line on the video over there. So, anyways. Well, the problem with Illiterate Inc. is you always made Daro feel really bad, so she quit, um, she quit coming. <laughs> Actually, she just works. Yeah, but didn't move the path. Yeah, maybe. Maybe something like that. The only problem is, is even the path is a little different. Because see, if you look over here, see the inside of the curve? The power line's right there, right? But in this case, if we were going to accept this, it, that does work really well, though. You know, you look at that and you see the road curving around, although then it curves out that way again. So that doesn't, it'd be more like... Yeah. Just doesn't really work that well. Yeah. So this actually curves and then it curves back again.
Wow. <laughs> this is my favorite thing. That's why sometimes it, it's quiet and then I realize, oh, wait, I've got a show I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> Working off of now, years after investigating this cold case. That's the theory that I'm working off of. Now, years after investigating this cold case. What's that right there? Does that look like a tree to you guys? Let's see if that's still around. I think I can still see the power lines right here. Like maybe, let me go forward again. Yeah, that's exactly where I was seeing it, right there. Right here. This is 1998. So, we're looking at that. Back to that spot again. So maybe that there it goes. Oh, maybe that's it. Right there. Here we go. How about this? This kind of makes sense. This is the little this thing right there. Maybe that's this. It's just maybe that was more of a road back then. Although then that goes like that. Well, maybe we're just not seeing that part. See, all we're seeing up here, but maybe it goes back out a little bit at the top right there. So let's say you're looking at it like this, and that became a, a the prop. I think this is it. Look, look at that right there. I mean, that's a little bit more curved than that, but down here, and then look right there, you got that opening. Maybe there's a house just off to the left here. And then it goes up like this, and then this right here is that. But this is but 20 years before it was a little bit more prominent or something. Let's see. Let's just see what that even looks like. Maybe I just way off. See now there's nothing there, you know. Just I mean that used to be it looks like a, a road or something. Now it's just a line of trees. That thing. So let's go back uh, 20 years. Or actually, not even 20. Yeah, I guess I need to go back. That's no, right, right there. So there's still trees there. I don't know if that's a little road. Heck, I don't know. Screw it. <laughs> I'll try to look for something tomorrow. I'm sure Craft said will send, uh, send an email in. Hey, it's right there, man. I got it. Here's the uh, the coordinates. All right. <laughs> to me, I'm not to map savvy, but I understand after a while. Yeah. Well, it's fun just to try to figure out different spots. Sergeant Van is working off. Maybe there's more. Let me go look through this. Hold on. Thanks, Claudia Neubauer. Or, as I like to say, Claudia Neubauer.
their bodies 20 miles away, scattered in a... Yeah. Another late night into the mornings. Thank you for being the beast. So how come this looks like the same crime scene, but it's just years later? That's what it seems like they're saying. Bodies 20 miles away, scattered in a wooded area off State Road 37 in Johnson. Okay, State Road 37. Let's see. Hold on. What's the name of this thing? 600. Or 37 somewhere down. Oh, there's 37 right there. And that's funny because my original pin was way over here. Maybe we need to look at that again. Hold on. Stone Crossing Road. Let's hear that again. It's 20 miles away, scattered in a wooded area off State Road 37 in Johnson County. They were killed three different... Oh man, hold on, I gotta, I gotta, <laughs> this might be a, hold on, let me, uh, <laughs> I gotta get, go to the, a different year here. This thing right here, does that does that have any resemblance? No, it's backwards to that. I wonder if it's more in this. You know, I'm kind of thinking it's in this patch over here. Because see, this looks like a subdivision, right? It's also closer to what they just said. It's also wooded, where this over here is not. And really kind of never was okay and if you look at the okay that's 1998 and it's pretty sparse then but I'm wondering if well hold on we can go back a little further now that's 1992 Yeah, I don't think that's there. See that little area right there? If you go, that's 1999, 98, pan out a little bit more. That's 92. So just keep your eye on that spot right there. Let's see, that's 90. Yeah, right there. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder if that's the spot right there. And it's actually... Um, but that's closer to more like a mile and a half to there. Yeah. I'm trying to go... The one article seemed really specific, though, didn't it? It said 200 yards off of this highway or, you know, road... Um, it was called uh, Stone Crossing Road. Stones Crossing Road 
It was 200 yards off of that and a mile west of the school, which is right there. But I'm kind of thinking, though, that this could be the area right there. Because that other one said off of this highway. Maybe just the distance was off. <laughs> Thank you, Delusional Lucidity. Gray, hello dear, I've been expecting you. Yes. You are so f r i k k i n m m m m e e a a a a n n n n. Awesome, I am mean. Hey, check it out, check it out. See, if you go to that video that Beth uh, posted, and you go to, um, it does, you know, I was looking at the tower, it didn't look the same, but it looks just like these. So hold on, where is that spot? Come on. Oh, there it is. Is that it? No. Crap, where the hell did it go? Now I can't find the overhead because it's only like a second. You have the time frame of that overhead? Delusional lucidity. Is that it? Absolute priority. Oh man, actually that one had... Um... That's more... That's a... Hey, let me get some of these. ...about how her sister and the three other Burger Chef employees were brutally murdered. I'm honestly... Yeah, I wonder if that's a blanket or something. Solved. Looks like there's a body right there. This case takes absolute priority over all other matters. Man, where the hell did the aerial go, damn it? Jesus. It's 20 miles away, scattered in a wooded... Yeah, 20 miles away, scattered in a wooded area. Hey, Beth, if you're still out there, do you have the time code of that? Because I, I just got to get back to it. I think I'm close to finding this spot. I should have done a screenshot, but didn't. You think it was at the beginning? I don't remember that. Maybe, maybe you're right, though. That's an aerial of bodies on the ground, but that's not the one I was looking at, where the cars were parked. mother Rachel well sadly Rachel passed away shortly after slide do nothing fall season burned again passed away the sergeant now wants anyone you van believes the is going to prison hey thanks Donna V Sergeant van is that's the I believe sergeant the cold with the question burger man 
think we're getting closer and closer. Looks like you'll need this gray for when you go to mean jail. Scattered in a way. Bailing ramen noodles. Lol. <laughs> yeah. I might need that when I go to mean jail. That's so weird how I, I can't find that stupid aerial now, even though I found it before. Easily. I just kind of was clicking. I could have sworn it was over here, though. Kids, that's the theory that I'm working off of. Yeah, now, there it is. Years after <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I go, wow, that looks kind of how he looked right before, because that's how we were playing it. Okay. All right, so let's do this part again here. Now watch right over here, this, this um, power line, but it doesn't look like one of the main power lines. You know the big um, pyramid-looking ones, you know, that are just really sturdy? I mean, they're all sturdy, but you know what I'm talking about. Watch. Now, here's now look, that looks like one of the ones that has a, a T, like a little... Um, it looks different. I don't know how to explain it, but it looks totally different to me. And now watch, when I go to Google Earth here, this is the, that is what it looks like, one of these types. You see how it has the little T cross on it? It's not the other ones that were over there. So I think this one is closer to being in the right area. You know, so we, that's, and that matches being in this other cluster over here, not, not over here. So it's not this area right there. It's actually right here, and this actually matches the pin placement that I had originally. I didn't just type, what's up, freaks, okay? I didn't have time. That's one of my bots that typed that in. So you can see, right in here, you've got this power line, and that looks a hell of a lot closer to me to that look. So let, let's see. So where, where can we find anything that curves like that at all? I guess we always have to just keep in mind that nothing looks the same anymore. See, th this is what I'm seeing right there. Right there. See how it's got the little crossbar and the, that's what these are. It's not those main, those really huge sort of steel pyramid looking power line things. I know Cairo probably knows what they're called, but I actually don't know what those are called. I don't know what, the, what, what they're called in differently than these ones. But these are, um, I think these are power lines too, right? So if you go over to these ones, see these have the... See how that's just totally different, just massive... huge almost look like cell tower you know just right and then you've got these smaller ones over here and these are the ones that look like the ones in the video that Beth put up there and let's see That can't be it. <laughs> now that's a pretty good candidate right there. But. All right, so here we go. What do you think, guys? And look at that. Look at this right here, everybody. What do you think? And look at this right here. Right there, there's the power line, and boom, right there, too. Same same spot on the inside of the curve. Boom! Come on. I think that's it. And, I, and this thing right there, I think is, let's see, so it goes up like this, and I think that might be this road right there, not the main road. It's just, and that's why it has a curve to it, like we were saying. Come on. Come on. What do you guys think? Let's vote it in. 
I think that might be it. And look at it's old, you know, it's an old road there. <laughs> I think that's it. All I can say is I think that's it. Let's see. So if it curves up, well, then that can't be that road there can't be this one. But, you know, who knows? Maybe it looked a little different back back in the day. Because if it curves, let's see. So, if it, well, let's see. Maybe it's this road, actually. Yeah, it can't be that one either. So that sure looks like it, though, doesn't it? Look at that. That's in exactly the right spot, this tower right there. And you can kind of see that. Let, let's try to play that again and see what, what it's doing. Now, years after investigating the this cold case, Oh, and look at this. Is, is that another thing there? I mean, I'm looking at this tree here, but I don't know if that's in the right spot. But man, that's uh, very similar to what I'm seeing right there. But it looks like it's off to the left. It's, it wouldn't be right next to the road like that. I don't know, I think that's a good likelihood, but maybe not, you know. It's like everything else is lined up so well. If you put it like that, right? And then this power line is exactly where the one that was over here is. After in right there. Yeah, the curve. And that. Well, let's take a look back in 1998. Yeah, well, we also don't see that road that cuts off to the side there either, do we? But look how close that is, just looking at that, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just nuts. Feels good. Yeah, this road isn't there, but this is 1998. And this happened in 1978, Miss H. So the image that you're seeing on the left is 1978. This over here is 1998. So in 20 years, it easily could have built a road over here because they said that a subdivision... Uh, kind of moved into that area so I think I don't know God, it really feels like it because there's a, a, a right here a power line and then it's hard to make it out in this shot here but if we go back to 2018 where you can see it better it's right there it's the exact spot right on the curve it's right there so, and, and it's right here on that one. So that's what, you've got a few things. You got the correct shape of the road and look how old the road is too. Not that that really matters that much, but it's just, it's been there a long time. Curves around. Now this part appears different a little bit, right? Like it curves around. It's almost like you see it about like this angle. And, you know, the part that's not working up here is that you'd think this might be going like that because this starts curving and then there's something and it runs into something maybe later and then the road comes like this. So that's one of the issues we're having right now. So pretty close, though. I mean, I got to admit that, I mean, this being here on that curve makes me think, think that is it. And then just over time, let's see what happened in 1998. Well, look at that. 1998, that road wasn't even there. So uh, I guess the part that's weird is this road. Let's see what happens.
I mean, that just looks perfect. Especially with the uh, the power line, right? <laughs> man. Oh, man. I just, I, I hate it when you don't, you can't absolutely get a time frame that's close and street view and all that. But how about this? Let's try this. Let's now go out of, not that. Investigating this cold case, Sergeant... Let me go back a little. Let's let me get that. Working off of. Now, years after invest. Okay. That's when I have that. So I don't have to try to find that again. <clears throat> All right. So let's see if this looks consistent with some of those images. Yeah. I mean, the woods kind of looks like that on the, the more recent shot that they were showing us. But that's just it. We can't see what it looked like back then. The other shot was... Well, you also have this, this one here. I don't know if that's right off the road. All right, I'm just gonna make a couple, you know, a little bit more attempts to find anything better than that. Because I think it might be right there. And look at, there's even a hill, I think over here too. See, and this also fits the whole thing about there being a subdivision that was built there now, but there wasn't one back then, right? So if we go, even if we go back to 1998, there aren't, I don't think there's as many. See, now there's a whole bunch more littering the entire area there. But back then, you know, you had, uh, let's see. See, this house is new. That one isn't there. 1998, I don't think. No, it's not. But this is, again, this is 20 years later, and it was approved not too long after the murders where they were building there. All right, I'm going to put another pin right there. I mean, the reason this is so perfect because it has the curve and then it curves again and then straightens out. The only problem is, is that image makes it look like a road goes like, like this from that. Yeah, I'll definitely do probably a, a paranormal or you know, a channel Halloween show. I bought a whole outfit, like a green screen outfit to wear. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah, so basically all you'll see is my face and the rest of me is gone. <laughs> all right. Or maybe you'd rather have, you know, see everything but my face. I'm a butt him face. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Good night, everybody. All right, let's see. Gosh, I really think that's it. And there's even a hill. Look at that. There's this little hill there, and that was part of the... In one of the shots, you have these people with metal detectors, and it goes up a hill there. Could be right over here, too, right? I guess we're just not going to know. That's going to be my, my best guess. Although that has a similar look. Let's go over there really quick. All right. And make one last effort over here. So that, that goes through the power lines. Could it be this? No, that's backwards. And then, see, the reason that works so well is really the power lines. And that's the, that is what those ones look like. It's on the same curve. We just have a different shape of a road that goes off like that. I don't know... If that ever changed this road, I don't know. No idea. So anyways, yes, we just spent like an hour trying to figure out where that spot was. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry I get frustrated sometimes on the show. You know, I know some people hate it, whatever, but uh, at the same time... You know, like early on, we had somebody that was like, hey, Gray, have you covered this one? Have you covered that one? And I said, yes, I did cover that one. I did cover that one two nights ago. But couldn't you ask me that in an email instead of disrupting the show? Okay? Because I actually spend a lot of time putting all the stuff together to do the show. Right? So everyone's throwing out, oh, look at this, 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 look at this. You know, and it's like, oh, God. You know, it, I know people are trying to help. But at the same time, it just, <laughs> I, I'd like one of you guys to try it, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty daunting sometimes, like you're just going, oh God. Yeah, memorial tree, yeah, yeah. Well, it looks like they've built a, an entire um, you know, like the, the subdivision's been put there. We can't go back far enough in time to look at historical clear footage of that area from 19 even like 1984 would probably be good, but we don't have that. Yeah, yeah. Drives gray bonkers. Yeah, I didn't even get to get to the uh, the ne the next case. I didn't get to do it. There was another one that I collected stuff for. This one was pretty crazy. Um, a guy and a girl were killed. And they were in a, uh, they found her in a barrel a year later on, in a creek. And, you know, in good old safe uh, Indianapolis, right? So she was found in a barrel. And then uh, the boyfriend was missing. So they at first thought maybe he had something to do with it. But then they eventually believed that he was... Um, also killed and put in a barrel. They just never found that barrel. And she was, I mean, she was absolutely beautiful. Not that that makes any difference, but it's like, wow. I mean, you know, it's like, how do you, I don't know. It's just, I don't even know how to word it. It's just stupid. Yeah, so here, here's just the quick synopsis of it. She kind of looks like the girl that was part of the... Um, she was the one that was found in the barrel a year later. So it says, Marianne Higginbotham disappeared on June 6, 1978. 
uh, on June 5th, almost exactly a year later, the body of Marianne Hickenbotham was found in a 55-gallon drum in White Lick Creek in Mooresville. The victim had been shot in the back of the head. Police believe Mary Ann Hickenbotham was murdered at her home in Clayton, then put in a barrel, which was placed in White Lick Creek. Her boyfriend, Timothy Willoughby, also went missing at the same time. Willoughby's body has never been found, but police believe he died the same day as Mary Ann Hickenbotham. Right? But, I mean, she looks like... Um, God, what's that girl's name that was part of the um, ob? Not, uh, let's see, what was it? Mamas and Papas, right? Now she's 22 years old. You should try checking for historical aerial photography. Yeah, I could. Uh, I know that uh, Woods. Girl, child, and kid. What, I can't remember the name. I always forget the whole name. I know she um, has looked into stuff like that, too. I, I've i looked at it, too, but a lot of times it's not clear, even on the old photography. But I guess I could check that out. Maybe there's just some old photographs of that area. I don't know. Yeah. But apparently, this could be perhaps drug-related, too, or related to uh, her boyfriend was a witness to, I think, like a chop shop, and they took him out, and they took her out, too. Crazy. All right, everybody, hit that like button, even you, Beth. That's what I was just saying, a car theft thing, a, like a chop shop. That's, what, that's, what, that's what's in the uh, articles that I have over here. And here's what the creek looks like in general. Yeah. Just one of those really small, dirty creeks. But I bet when it gets flooded, it's probably raging. So who knows where the barrel was put in. They've checked a whole bunch of areas. But anyways, I guess we'll go over that uh, tomorrow. Go over this one. But yeah, if you guys find uh, aerial photographs, send them to me. But make sure it's an aerial photograph of the area. Exactly what we're talking about. Not... Hey, here's an aerial photograph, Gray. Uh, is it, does it help? No, that's actually not even within 100 miles. Thank you, though. No, that's pretty dirty, yeah. <laughs> you don't think that's dirty? Look at it. It goes right through the, the, the town. Yes, you used to raff in it. I'm sure when you were a kid, it was absolutely beautiful. Nothing in Indiana is bad. There's no crime in Indiana. Every creek's beautiful. Um, everything's awesome. It's so amazing. Like, and I'll actually be honest uh, about stuff in, in Portland. Yes, the scenery is pretty, but other than that, it's a joke. All right? It's, em it's an embarrassment. Yeah, yeah, Oregon's pretty, but it's, um, you know, like Fano Creek, the one I get the trout pictures in, is it's disgusting. There's shopping carts in it. There, uh, there are, you know, nobody gives a damn about anything like that. And it's just, it's not a crystal clear bubbling stream. I doubt anybody would drink out of White Lick Creek, okay? Especially with a name uh, name like that, I'm just you know. No, I just looked up a. Um, there's a 1980, 1980s case that they're reopening, 
And so I looked up a website to find cold cases in Indiana to see if I could figure out which 1980s case, because they exhumed, they dug up the grave, okay? So uh, this just happened like the last couple of days. So I went to that site, and it was really cool. It was, uh, let me show you what it looked like, the site. See, here it is right there. See, it's called Cold Cases by County. And I thought, God, wouldn't it be great if every state or had the same damn thing? So look at you click on here, and then it says these are the five cold cases in there. Look at 87, 89, 89, 90. So it could be any one of those that they are all but one of those. Then you click on this county here, and you get 74, 86, 2003, right? Then you click on this county over here, and you get 78, 78, 88, 89, 93, 2005, 5, 2011, right? And you click on this one over here, and you get 91, 2003, 2012. But while looking these up, you find a ton of other ones. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, when I say looking them up, you find other crimes just in the paper that you're looking at, right next to it. Oh, man. Uh, you know, two people stabbed to death on da -da -da, right next to the article that you're reading. And then here we got this one, just one, 1983, Ruby Car. This is, uh, maybe, did I do this one already? Yeah, 91, 2003, 2012, all right. This one, look how many this one is. 1970, 74, 75, 76, 81, 82, 85, 86, 91, 92, 95. 2002. See, there's all these. Like these, well, I'm sure all of these are interesting, right? I'll click on this one. Um, at approximately 6:30 p.m., Pamela Ann Smith left her rural resident farm east of Greens Fork, Indiana, to go for a short walk. When Pamela Ann Smith failed to return home, she was reported to police as missing person. On 3:30:76, the remains of Pamela Ann Smith were discovered just off a country road in eastern Henry County, Indiana. Now I can go and find the references to when she was found and everything in the old newspaper articles. Um, I do notice that you don't see a lot of the somebody's missing articles. Because you know the girl that was found in the barrel? I didn't find anything about when she was missing. Like nobody, there was no article saying, oh, she's missing. And she was found a year later. And then you go, oh, yeah, well, she's been missing for a year. Well, thanks for telling us. We, di we didn't know. All right, then we got this one is 1992, 86. Looks like there's a 2012 up there, 97, 92, 91, 78, 74. And look at this, unidentified torso here. This would have fit in nicely that other night. Um, a human male torso was discovered floating in a big walnut creek near US 40. The body had been in the water approximately five to 10 days. To date, the remains have not been identified. That's a perfect one for the DNA Doe Project. Yeah, we could have Torso Murder Night by talking about first the Cleveland Torso Murders, the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run, I think is what it was called. Something like that. Okay, let's just pick this one. Oh, here's another unidentified torso. What's going on here? How do you have two in the same county here? So this is 18 years later. And look at that, location, one mile north of US 40. Didn't we just see that on this one? Near US 40. I mean, I know that's a big freeway that goes through there, but it's a little weird, don't you think? A serial killer. Circumstances, on April 3rd, 1992, the torso of an adult male was located along the roadway. To date, the remains have not been identified. Again, let's get a hold of DNA Doe Project and get those identified, don't you think?
I'm not. Oh, jeez. What's going on? And they're in the same county. You now the same grouping. That's pretty weird. Yeah. Yeah, what time is it? That's oh, only 12, okay. On September 12, 1977, Anne Louise Harmier was reported missing after failing to return to her Bloomington campus of Indiana University. She's only 20 years old. Her rust-colored Pontiac Le Mans was found locked and empty on the shoulder of State Road 37, about two miles north of Martinsville. So that could be that her car was broke down and she got out, locked the door, and was walking somewhere. And then somebody said, hey, do you need a ride? Well, let's see. The car was later found to have, there you go, a faulty thermostat. I hadn't even read that part yet, everybody. I know it seemed like I could have just read it, but I literally didn't. 36 days later, Harmir's body was found in a cornfield approximately seven miles northeast of Martinsville, Indiana. It was determined that she had died from strangulation by a shoelace. So after her car broke down, she got out, started walking, maybe even somebody pulled up, and they murdered her. I mean, it just, it sucks. I mean, this it's sick how, you know... <laughs> I mean, there's just so many barbarians driving around out there. Yeah. Not sure what the fire truck accident had to do with anything, Dottie, but uh, keep on drinking, all right? Uh, we need Gray and Nancy Grace. All right. Let's see. I wonder if there's any more. So what, who, what was that? That was... Um, was that this one? Yeah, 1977, right? So let's see. So that was 77. How about this one? How about uh, Bennett Brown? Bennett Brown was last observed in Chicago after completing his freshman year at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois. Brown was believed to have been wearing blue jeans, white Adidas style tennis shoes, and red hooded front zipper type sweatshirt. Brown indicated he was leaving Chicago to go work at a boys camp, but the name of the camp and address is unknown. Brown's body was found in rural Lawrence County near the end of May. Evidence indicated Brown had been st stabbed multiple times. God damn. <laughs> yeah, that was a joke, Dottie. Yeah, don't worry about it. I don't know what you're talking about. Fire truck accident, though. I, I still don't get that part, but, you know, maybe eventually I'll get that. I don't know what that meant. Well, explain what that means, Dottie. Instead of keep saying, yes, I know, hey, geez, geez. Just explain what you mean by fire truck accident was bad. Oh, let's see. So here's another one. She's 33 years old. The circumstances. Kilo Waddell. I mean, this is just Indiana, by the way, right? Was a well-known and well-loved member of the Medora community in rural Jackson County. She was a teacher at the Medora Elementary School and a mother to her three small children, a son and his younger twin brother and sister. Uh, Keela lived in a mobile home located behind her mother and father's residence in Medora. Keela was last seen alive in the evening hours of August 17, 1988, Keila Waddell was murdered in the overnight or morning hours between August 17th and August 18th, 1988. Keila Waddell's 
lifeless body was discovered in her mobile home by her mother in the morning hours of August 18, 1988. It was discovered that Keela had been bludgeoned to death in her bedroom. I mean, really? She's just a normal teacher, just chilling out. Yeah, you still didn't answer the questions, Daddy. I just, I just wanted to know what you were actually referring to, because it, I was like, "Wow, what, what fire truck?" You know. This is the Evansville district. Let's see, Deborah Ann Wilhite. There she is right there. Was last seen on October 16th. Hey, that's my birthday, man. I was, uh, wow. I feel so close to the case now. It must be, like, I, I know a lot more about it now just because of that. It's weird. Hmm. Oh, cool. <laughs> now I'm going to ask, what did that have to do with anything that we were talking about? <laughs> but I knew you knew that that, that was coming now, okay? <laughs> How about, yeah, let, me, let me look at this one. Deborah Ann Wilhite was last seen on October 16th, 1974, after leaving her job at the old windmill restaurant at Highway 41 and 57 in Gibson County, Indiana. She was seen leaving in her vehicle a green 1966 Ford Galaxy two-door hardtop with Indiana vehicle registration 26B2953. Her vehicle has not been located. Will Height was last seen speaking with a gentleman who was requesting a ride from the restaurant. So she's just completely disappeared at this point. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's 26, 40 something years ago. It's crazy. Fifteen-year-old Marie Bridget Patrick from Cincinnati, Ohio, and a sixteen-year-old female friend were in the process of running away from home to Texas. While hitchhiking, they were picked up by a truck driver. Boy, what a shock. In Cincinnati, who identif identified himself only as Bill. While on I-64... The mile marker 67. Isn't I-64 one of the highways of um, serial killer fame? The girls demanded to be let out amid sexual advances and threats from the truck driver. A struggle ensued and Marie was stabbed. Marie shoved her friend out the door of the moving truck and she suffered minor injury, but Marie was unable to get away. Wow, a struggle ensued, and Marie, okay, so while on I-64 at mile marker 67, the girls demanded to be let out amid sexual advances and threats. A struggle ensued, and Marie was stabbed. Marie shoved her friend out the door of the moving truck, and the friend suffered minor injuries, but Marie was unable to get away. The friend survived, but Marie was found dead of a fractured skull five miles further down the interstate. The truck driver has never been identified. Wow, that is, that is so messed up right there. Hold on, let me, let me see that.
Hey, look at it. It's Jay Case Vision. Look at that. There's the, the, the semis right there. Look at it. Yeah, she's a total hero. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Just pushed her friend out even though she was stabbed and she never made it out. Amazing. And the friend lived to tell the story. Catching up to the truck driver. Almost got him. Almost got him. There we go. So that's mile marker 88, right? So... Do you think the it would go um, like this direction would be 66, 67, I think it was? I'm going to go this way. And that was the other direction. That was 109. Darn it. And that was at uh, mile marker 67. Okay, so let's just go way... Oh, shit. I'm going to go way over here. If it's so clear that I could fly by and see a mile marker, I don't think that's one. But... I just want to get a picture of where this was. Yeah, I haven't done anything on my personal paranormal channel for a long time. Oh my god, Gray, that's so hypocritical. You're always making fun of the psychic because yeah, it's totally different what I do on there. It's not a... I'm not trying to pretend anything. I'm just letting you guys tell your stories about weird shit that you've seen that um, you can't explain. That's it. Okay? See the difference there? I'm not pretending. All right, there's 71.5 right there. All right. So I'm going to just see if this works, how well this might work. Okay. So I need to go, uh, so 71.5, 67. So I need to go four and a half miles the other direction. I don't know exactly where that was, but. I'll just go right there. How about that? Yeah, oh, look at that. There's a mile marker. <laughs> look at that. Right at the 67 mile marker. All right. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to put this I'm going to I'm going to add a folder. This one's weird. Uh, Bill the Trucker. All right. <laughs> 
<laughs> I get excited by little shit like that, but I don't know why. Yeah. So that's the spot right there where they were. Mile, mile marker 67. So this is where they made they got out of the truck, and I guess now we know that the the truck was heading um, westbound, and then they said what five miles later. Her body was found, so let's see if we can uh, get that on there. And I'm going to have to follow this right on the road, because that's how they usually measure this shit, like that. By driving it and then saying, yep, yeah, five miles. It's not crow fly stuff. So you can see, I'll move this over here, get the measurement out. We are now at 0.89 miles, right there. wasn't quite good enough right there. And it, oh wow, what's up with that? Okay, 1.97. Why does it do that? Stay on miles, okay? Thanks. Yeah. 2.39. Looks like I get some in there. 4.13, 4 4.5, 9, 9.1. That is the approximate location. I mean, I'm gonna make it thicker so you can see it. Put that up to four. Uh, apparently, somewhere in this area here, I wonder if he just kind of kicked her out the door. Probably what happened was, is she got stabbed and she got her friend out of the vehicle and then he grabbed onto her and then just beat her to death and literally, and she was kicking and fighting and fighting and fighting and he just beat her to death, pulls over to the side of the road and just, see that's what's weird is what time did we have on this incident? What, what did we have here? While hitchhiking, they were picked up at a truck by a truck driver in Cincinnati who identified himself only as Bill while on I-64 at the mile marker 67. The girls demanded to be let out amid sexual advances and threats from the other driver. A struggle ensued and Marie was stabbed. Marie shoved her friend out of the door of the moving truck and she suffered minor injury, uh, but Marie was unable to get away the friend survived, but Marie was found dead of a fractured skull five miles further down the interstate. I guess it's possible her being pushed out of the vehicle caused the fractured skull. The truck driver has never been identified. So this is 1981, right? and what was her name? Marie Bridget Patrick. Continued from page 20. How is that possible? Page 19. What page is what page are we on now? That seems like a page one. <laughs> See, I mean, look at that's what I'm saying. Every time I'm looking up another case, 
Mother in despair over disabled child kills self and her daughter. Yay! Go, Indiana! Woohoo! Huh? Yeah, it's like... I don't know if that's where it was, but I'm just going to look through here. It said page 20. Okay, that's page 5. How do, how do you go backwards? Why did it say continued from page 20 when it was on page 19 itself? 13, okay, that's page 13, that, but it says 11 down here. Page 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay, here's the, here's the first one. Attempt to join boyfriend ends in death for Ohio girl, all right? At 9 p.m. Wednesday, Donald Pat Patrick picked up the ringing phone in his Cincinnati home. The teenage voice at the other end of the long-distance call asked for Bridget, the Patrick's 15-year-old daughter. Patrick knew who was calling. Gary Moore, 17, called his girlfriend at the same time each week. On Sundays, Bridget called him and his new home, at his new home in Texas. And that's Bridget Patrick right there. Yeah, Marie Bridget Patrick. Okay. Usually they were happy calls. Despite their three-month separation, Bridget and Gary had remained devoted to each other. Bridget spent most weekends at home, not on dates. Frequently, she passed the time writing poems about her absent boyfriend. But Wednesday, Patrick's voice broke as he told young Gary that Bridget was not at home. Bridget was dead. Barely 12 hours before Gary's call, Indiana State Police Troopers had broken the news to Bridget's parents. Their daughter's body had been found along Interstate 64 in southwestern Indiana, just a few miles from where she had pushed her friend and traveling companion from a moving truck when the driver began making sexual advances toward her and the other girl. Cincinnati girl, um, let's see, the second Cincinnati girl, Robin Gay Walker, 16, managed to make her way to Jeffersonville, nearly 60 miles away. She was treated at a local hospital for minor injuries. I mean, that must have been freaky for her to be out there um, hitchhiking, trying to get somewhere, even though you know your, your buddy is still with this barbarian trucker. Last Tuesday, the girls told their parents they planned to attend a 9 p.m. show in the local movie house. Instead, the two teenagers went to the Brett Spence Bridge, with, uh, which spans the Ohio River at Cincinnati. Their destination was Texas, where Bridget planned to join her boyfriend. By 6.30 p.m., Robin told police the girls were on their way riding in the cab of a flat-nosed tractor pulling a white and silver trailer. A slender, black-haired man who introduced himself as Bill guided the truck across northern Kentucky and southern Indiana. Okay, so this is very late at night. I was kind of thinking it was, and that's the only way a trucker could push a body out and nobody else would see it. Like, if it was at 9 o'clock at night, I mean, or even, you know, between 5 and 10 at night, there'd be other people on the road driving around. Uh, but at 1.30, you'd have way less people, and you just would find an area that nobody was driving behind you directly, shove the person out. Um, so anyways, by 1.30 a.m. Wednesday, Linda Patrick was frantic. The movie had ended before midnight, but no one had seen her daughter. Okay, And this is from the... What, what uh, paper is this from? Oh, yeah, the Indianapolis Star on November 13th, 1981. The destination was Texas, where Bridget planned to join her boyfriend. By 6.30 p.m., Robin told police the girls were on their way, riding in the cab of a flat-nosed tractor, pulling a white silver trailer. 1.30 a.m. Wednesday, Linda Patrick was frantic. The movie had ended before midnight, but no one had seen her daughter. We walked the floor we looked everywhere miss patrick said on thursday 
And let's see, friends, neighbors, and relatives all received late night phone calls, but none could tell her, tell Mrs. Patrick where Bridget was. Finally, she called Robin's mother, Sandra Delph. She received information, but it did not, but it did little to ease her worry. Robin had called home just one hour earlier. For the first time, Mrs. Patrick learned of her daughter's plans to thumb her way to Texas. Uh, also learned that Bridget had managed to push Robin out of the truck and away from the grasping hands of the truck driver. Later, Miss Patrick, her husband and Bridget's brother and sister would learn what happened after Robin hit the pavement, injuring her arms and legs. Within moments, Bridget also leaped or was pushed from the truck, but she struck the gravel and grass at the side of the road with her head the impact split her skull. Okay, so that was kind of what I was thinking, that it could have been that the pavement did it to her. She escaped on her own, too. I thought maybe she was pushed and got injured that way, but she wasn't really bludgeoned in the vehicle. Um, so Bridget also leaped or was pushed from the truck, but she struck the gravel and grass at the side of the road with her head. The impact split her skull. Although police reports and reconstruction of the incidents have told Patrick how her daughter died, the mother continued Thursday to wonder why. Well, there's no explanation. There's just barbarians out there. Why did the girls get away and why did the, the other girl get away and not my Bridget? Well, she did. It's possible she did get away, but in her attempt to get away, she struck her head and split it. That actually makes more sense to me. I, I want to think that she, you know, tried to escape herself and she died in her escape. All right. But it also might not be that way. The, the person responsible for her death is the, the driver of the truck. Right? Obviously something really bad was happening to where she stabbed, right? I mean, the truck driver stabbed her. So this guy is already has intent to at least severely wound somebody. He's obviously, I think he's trying to kill one of them and then keep the other one. He probably was going to kill Bridget and then assault the other girl and then, and then kill her at a later time. He needed to get rid of one. However, the feisty one, Bridget, kicked her friend out of the vehicle so she wouldn't become a victim and then probably started fighting as well and then jumped out of the truck or she could have been pushed out of the truck as well. We don't, we're, we're not going to know that, I guess. Police said Bridget, whose full name was Marie Danae Bridget Patrick, had indeed suffered a knife wound in her upper right thigh. So it wasn't a fatal wound at that point. So let's see, upper right thigh. Man, he must have reached all the way over there. That's kind of weird. I mean, you kind of picture, like, he's driving the truck. Both girls are sitting next to... And she must be the one in the middle because she was able to push her friend out. So he reached all the way across her and stabbed her leg. You almost wonder if he meant to stab the other girl and that would keep them sort of locked into the vehicle like um she would like if he was let's say he killed the one by the the window the door itself well that would kind of that would block bridget too because there would be no way to get past that it'd be tough anyway yeah, everybody hitchhiked back then uh, the wound, the injured skull, and numerous gravel marks from scraping along the ground all shocked Bridget's aunt, Donna Roberts, when the identification of the body Thursday afternoon. I can't believe I just identified my niece's body, she said. The day that it happened, I was up at the house, here with her, talking, laughing, putting on makeup. I can't believe she's dead. Police said Tuesday evening was... 
Not the first time Robin had tried to run away from home, but according to Miss Patrick and Mrs. Roberts, Bridget had never even hitchhiked before. Well, that's, I doubt that. Okay, so this is the girl that must have survived then. Is that right? No, it's not even the right. Hold on. Hmm. Yeah, that's messed up. And and probably the guy's name wasn't Bill. Right? It was a pretty good description of the truck, though, wasn't it? Anyways, uh, I just thought I'd go over that story pretty quickly. Usually I spend a lot of time getting all the different articles over time. But uh, isn't it interesting how you can find that and then go back and find the original stories and kind of see what they were thinking and then sort of follow it through the years on these old newspaper sites? Oh, I still have tips for GHI. Oh, boy. Yeah. All right, everybody. I think that is it. I might have to... I'm going to save this over here on my other window. Or, let's see, not that one. Not that one either. This, I keep going to that one. It's over here. There we go. I just closed Google Earth, I think. Of course, when I closed Google Earth, I probably lost everything that I just found. I accidentally hit the window. Let's see. Is it even in here? Oh, there. Yeah. Build a trucker. Yeah, I got that in there. Okay, good. I'm getting so used to hitting the save my places now that I think it's time to go back to Utah again. It's always a safe flying area. Yes, I'm still here, believe it or not. I know I got really quiet, but... I was looking for my... Uh, the main window that I shut down earlier on accident. So I got that open, and now I'm going to go look at something else. Oops. Okay. So thank you to uh, Alexander on PayPal, Alexander. Um, I don't know if that's Raven. <laughs> I don't know if that is that today. Yeah, today Raven and. Uh, Donna, so thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Oh, by the way, what do you guys think of this right here? See, this is what I. This is what my hat is. Visors. I, I got. I, I, they're not going to be on Streamlabs though. I had to buy them individually. But look at freak, gray hues and that. See, that's what you are, right? <laughs> that's what it is. You are a freak. It wouldn't say freaks or anything like that, right? But it just says Freak Gray Hughes Investigates. So there you go. I think it'll be cool. That's what I'll be wearing when, it's fine. when I finally get that. I won't be wearing my Under Armour 
visor. But I'll, I'm going to be getting like 20 something of these. Oh, and hey, Dennis, thank you. Uh, I got your the thing that you sent. That's cool. And what's cool is the uh, the baseball thing that you sent. I'll just give it to my my dad and brother, Andy. Actually, he's really into. That's what he does. Baseball. That's all they care about. <laughs> they talk about baseball every two seconds. But anything. So I'm gonna be getting. I think I'm only. I only ordered 25 or 24 of them. But I'll have to actually ship them myself. Well, visors are weird for some people, Joe. I, I, I actually don't like what baseball hats look like. I like visors. Right. <laughs> hey, that's exactly what I think, Rachel. Same thing. Yeah, you gotta send me an email and explain that to me. I don't know. Uh, And then I can explain it to them once you uh, explain it to me. Right. I just got that today, too. But man, you packed that box up like it was, uh, you know, you're going to protect the insides from a nuclear bomb. I don't know, I don't know who Koozies is. I just did a, a random site. No, it was called Logo Software, that one. It was really easy, and it allowed it to be bigger. So I think those are cool as hell, right? So I might, maybe I'll send them out to people for various things. You know, maybe uh, patrons, Patreon freaks, you know, people that uh, have donated. Oogla Boogla. That's right. Oogla Boogla mugs. <laughs> Don't forget to get your Oogla Boogla mugs. Anyways, uh, let me go back to the... So here we go. Um, on Super Chats, I want to say thanks to Sandra Metcher, Raquel Bedgood Corley, Cairo Al Kadir, Kit Kat, and Claudia Neubauer. Woods Girl and Kids got back from her fishing trip and Claudia Neubauer delusional lucidity who is lucid and delusional at the same time it's amazing and radical raccoon thank you very much for supporting the channel all right so you guys ready to do the uh, the flyby yes gray I've been ready to do the flyby for 45 damn minutes I wonder if I can do, uh, let me see if I can get, well, it doesn't matter. I was going to put the sound effects open, but it's too late anyways for that.
here. Where's the peaks? It doesn't say it. Oh, darn it. Ah, it's not there. It's not there. Yep, oh, gonna go back to where I was. I tried, therefore, your Patricia, but it didn't just go to a peak. No problem, Dave. This place is this place is so crazy looking. It, doesn't even look real, it's like, kinda of weird. There's so much graphics in here that it takes forever to load up. See there you go, now it's loaded up. Okay. This will be cool looking. Watch this. Here comes the reveal over the edge of the cliff, everybody. Oh! <laughs> fix there for a second. But. It almost seems like crystals or something. Just in, in looking at a rock. Okay. <laughs> all right. Anyways, thank you all for showing up to the Gray Hughes Investigates show. Maybe I'll end it on my uh, 
doing the Art Bell. I like that one. There we go. We'll send it like that. <laughs> Anyways, all right. Hey, if you're still out there, Beth. Thank you for uh, the video there and a couple of your images, even though they were in my articles that I was going to put out later. But the video was helpful. Hopefully, you found the right spot. But thank you. And that's it for the show tonight, everybody. From the green forests of the Pacific Northwest, I bid you all good evening. <laughs> well, or good morning, as the case may be. All right. So that's it for the show tonight, everybody. And until next time, be safe out there. <laughs>